Good day, everyone. It is May the 3rd, not May the 4th, which is tomorrow for Star Wars fans. Uh, we have Michael, Dan, Jan, uh, Antronic, myself, and uh, Jamie in the call. Hi there, Dan. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, some questions. Today is more prodish uh, meeting. So if anyone has questions, do jump in and I'll go from the list who uh, whoever has added. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Ryo. Uh, we got a uh, picture from uh, um, Michael. Uh, Michael, can you confirm Ryo on the left? left. He That's is indeed him. on the left. Very yes. kind gentleman. We had a blast that night after the event. Condolences Thank to the family. Um, Jan has some production observations. Uh, Jan, do you want to just jump into it? Sure, there's nothing else. Um, so one common thread from almost everyone uh, working on jail managers was they wanted some kind of demon uh, and that error recovery is a problem. And this hasn't really been much of a problem for me in my production deployments where I just used jail.conf. And so I wanted to re-examine the differences and find out what caused these problems because my jail usage in production is normally fairly simple. Just put an alias on an interface, uh, maybe mount a DevFS and run. But jail managers, especially the container like once tend to be a bit more involved. And I had a use for something along those lines uh, for a VNet jail isolated from the host network stack, which could only use a WireGuard uh, VPN interface as its only network interface. So I wanted to see what happens in this case. Well, I stumbled into the exact two uh, problems as the others have and boiled them down to the existing state management in the jail command is too primitive. And there is a total mismatch between the lifetime of the jail uh, user space process and the jail kernel uh, struct. So the, what you see in JLS, the jail with a jail ID and name and parameters has a different lifetime from the user space process because normally the jail is started. So the user space lifetime begins, the user space does what it does, runs to completion and exits. And that's the normal expected operation. Then the at some point, if you want to shut down the jail, you run the user space again, and it tears down the jail, but in between there's nothing watching for state changes. The other problem is that what state management there is, is too primitive and fragile. So uh, the jail command only handled some of the state ex and expects the kernel to asynchronously handle the rest, and it ignores a significant part of the state which should be managed, uh, a common pain point where this explodes into the face of uh, existing jail managers or um, enterprising users is when they um, try to dynamically mount file systems because it works kind of. And if you ever have a problem, you're left with a state jail doesn't know how to recover from or to, how to reuse. You have to do it yourself. So um, what happens is that the jail command aborts on the first error it encounters, which is good. You shouldn't gloss over errors, but it only performs partial cleanup. It destroys the jail if it's supposed to set one up and fails anywhere along the way. But uh, it can only unmount some file systems. For example, you can't forcibly unmount uh, DevFS if there's a FDesk FS mounted inside of it, because you can't, from user space, force the kernel to unmount a file system if, there, if there's a mount point inside this file system. 
uh, kind of makes sense, but um, the other problem is while you have lots and lots of ways to hook every step along the way, you can't hook error handling right now at least. So users are left with the partially cleaned up state. They couldn't do anything to do their own error handling. Uh, but what makes it even more confusing to new users who think in terms of documented uh, parameters and documentation tutorials and not instead of implementation details is that the abstraction, the jail configuration uh, format has break down. Um, so right now, for example, you can say that I want a uh, DevFS, but there is one, the user sees a mounted device file system and jail refuses to start because there's a mounted device file system, which is in a way understandable, and, but also a problem. So what, but coming back to the lifetime mismatch right now, as far as I understood the jail code, Jamie can probably say a lot more about that. He's responsible for this, that if you start the jail command, it takes a look at, at its command line arguments, uses that to find a config file, potentially passes the command line argument and config file, translates the command requested within the configuration loaded into a list of commands to be run to completion. So we kind of have a command list slash state machine, which gets run. Uh, and if there's any error along the way, there's a partial recovery for it. But again, you can't extend it. And whatever state the user space track, for example, if I'm running jl-c, the following happens. I will paste it into the chat. Uh, I left out the parsing of command line arguments. But now all the state, and if I destroy it, again, this happens. Uh, sorry for the... Uh, It, that should be exits, not uh, exists. Um, so, and state changes along the way are ignored because there is no user space daemon um, responding to events as they happen. It only responds to the events it's waiting for. And um, so going forward, I think we can either uh, attempt uh, futilely uh, to implement perfect state tracking and automatic error, error recovery, solve the general AI and halting problem along the way to uh, implement automatic error handling for arbitrary user code. So uh, that's uh, futile. We should only do go a little bit in this direction of improving the state handling. Uh, but the other problem is the operations performed as part of this command list are sometimes either too large or too small. Instead, we should look for idempotent operations. We can refactor out of this command uh, list so that we can break it up into idempotent operations, which can check if the desired state is already reached and then respond to this and skip over, for example, mounting an already mounted file system again. Mm, the next thing is that we need um, some way to handle error recovery and the translation from configuration abstractions to co operations should include automatic error recovery attempts. For example, let's say I'm comfortable dedicating the mount point of a jail to the jail uh, and taking it away from other user commands or the global file system uh, mounting table. So in that case, I can 
have the jail command automatically unmount all file system it uh, it's already finds there under the jail mount point so that the state which is left over gets cleaned up so we should always perform cleanup attempts or at least detect if they are needed so that it gets more resilient to um, out of sync states. Yep. I wanted to uh, talk about this um, last week, but there was a more uh, interesting topic available. So, may I? There is some uh, ability for cleanup in that uh, when a jail install fails at any stage, it just runs through a jail remove process as if you had done a jail dash r so right. any hooks that you have for removing a jail those still run for removing a partly generated jail as well so if you want okay, hooks to that... look at what mount points there are then you could uh, apply those hooks okay maybe it's just that the order of operation was uh, in the error path was so different that my hooks just bailed out because they already checked preconditions but i didn't observe the effect but that's good to hear that. Uh, so uh, this complaint at least is invalid. Glad to uh, learn about that. So I missed it. So so um, I, I've done some work uh, in the last weeks as well. After our mm -hmm. uh, uh, Illumos folks have joined us via L. Uh, so there, uh, so for those who are not here, the, their Illumos uh, zones model is more similar architecturally to FreeBSD's Beehive model, as in there's a single process daemon running in the background that's making sure that their zone is doing that what it's supposed to do. Um, so if there are if there are any cleanups that are left to do, or you want to modify something, it knows mm -hmm. the steps to do that. So um, I've 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 built some of these ideas in my prototype, which is written mm -hmm. in Oberon, um, uh, which which parses configs from a very stupid UCL and outputs in libexo. You know the basic things there, and uh, what I've converted now is that you, when you run my new jail command, it it demonizes to the background as well. But the the problem that I saw, but this might be a mechanical problem. I'm not sure. Maybe it's an architectural problem. Uh, is that uh, if you have a if you have a let's say. Uh, a, a mount point inside of the jail that you are aware of, right? So you, you've defined it in your configuration, let's say mount devfs. It's very easy to, to figure out that, hey, there is devfs and I need to remove that. Uh, but if you have nested mount points, which is something very common if you're running Linux containers, so a jail that's running Linux binaries, because now you're using protfs and devfs and sysfs, and mm -hmm. I think the list can just go on. Um, interestingly, uh, so so in the current jail command, you can pass an fs tab. In my model, you don't pass an fs tab. You just say this is Linux. And then it just takes care of all of these things, you know, right. the pros and dev and stuff like that. The problem there is uh, some in, in in some sometimes I don't know why yet. Sometimes uh, you might need to force unmount things. Well, this is also has been very specific with um, uh, ZFS locking on a resource after the jail has been destroyed. So the devfs inside of it, you can't unmount it, and you can't even destroy the, the, the ZFS data set that the jail is on, right? For some reason, it's getting some kind of locking. I'm not sure if it's a ZFS issue or a jail issue. Most probably a ZFS issue that we haven't tested. So then here, here comes my question. What, what do I do in a scenario where, by design, I should be doing the cleanup, but then the only way to do cleanup is to do things forcefully? Right, so, so these are also interesting problems. And um, to to add more on that point, apparently there is a very nice um, problem that we have is uh, from a jail vendor point of view. And after learning with Illumos, is that 
in case of Illumos, I noticed that very late after I rewatched the video. Some things in their configuration is declarative and some things are imperative. Right in in the FreeBSD GL is is again kind of you know like the hooks are all imperative, but then the variables are all declarative, right? If you say you know for example allow VMM, that's a declarative thing. Right? Allow VMM and it automatically figures out what to do, or allow DevFS rule set. Sorry, DevFS rule set equals something, right? Those are declarative, but we also have some things that are that are imperative, and I think mm -hmm. that architecture is kind of I want to say weird, right? It would be better if it was always declarative. Like um, everything should be declarative, and the 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 pro the process, the jail command itself should do all the steps. Rather than the commands that you can run when setting up a jail are arbitrary, though hooks you can't exactly. make passive declarative hooks. Exactly. The other thing is which I noticed, if I understood correctly, if you point um, the jail command to an fs tab it tokenizes it into lines and runs each line uh, as one operation, which is an annoying limitation because I assume it happens because you, if I uh, saw it correctly in the code base, there was support for individual lines. So mount points before was support for running an FS tab. So it probably just reused the existing code, but the mount command already has a flag dash A for auto mounting an FS tab. And you can point, uh, feed it the FS tab through a pipe as standard input by having it read the uh, FS tab from dev std in. So you can already reuse the existing mostly idempotent uh, auto mounting logic in the mount command for a jail. Uh, which is what I did by uh, because I pushed the jail.conf uh, uh, language a bit past its design goals. And what I now do, and I made uh, extensive use of the libxo support in mount uh, to find out all mount points, uh, print them out as JSON, run them to the JQ to get the reverse list of mount points so that I get the mount points in the right order to pipe into X arcs uh, to pipe into U mount. And the uh, U, uh, forcibly unmounting is a feature lacking under Linux, which is required to unmount a file system with open file descriptors. So you forcibly close the file descriptors, uh, the files and the file descriptors gets, get put into a faulted state. So th that is actually very interesting. So uh, should we actually modify the mount command to unmount in reverse order or like add a flag that says, hey, this uh, is the FS the, tab on, you know? The umount command, I think, does it if you give it and say that instruct it to automatically unmount all file systems in this FS tab, then oh. it does it. Okay. Which is why you want to make use of this existing logic okay. rather than breaking the SF, FS tab up into sing, single lines and then running mount each time uh, with no auto detection, which is why it breaks if the mount point is already where they mounted. If you instruct the mount to auto mount, if the mount point is there, mount is happy. It has already, its job is accomplished. It doesn't have to mount. So this idempotent auto detection is there in the mount command and in the unmount command, uh, then, not really because if it complains if a mount point doesn't exist, which is why I have to pre-filter it. And then I get commands like this. Mm. Let me check. And by the way, uh, Jamie, I was speaking with my mentor today because I'm writing in Oberon and he wrote the compiler. And at the end of the day, he was like, all right, you want if you want to put port some of your components back to FreeBSD from your Oberon implementation, you obviously have to write it in C. I was like, yes. And he's like, all right, here's a hidden flag that you here's a flag that you can use that will end up uh, generating a C code from the Oberon code. So now porting is, is, uh, porting is gonna be like, just copy pasting the code as you need. <laughs> well, <I'm> like, <laughs> that code isn't maintainable. 
Aber it, it depends, the output ja. of a transpiler is nothing the FreeBSD project can maintain and develop on. Yeah, I, that, that one I do agree with. Although, I mean, this is, you know, it's like a Pascalish language. So the, the output is is pretty human readable. Like I, I was amazed at okay. that. Like it's pretty human readable. I used uh, JSON and JQ mm -hmm. to avoid the usual pains with quoting if someone gets creative and insists on using annoying things like file names containing uh, in, uh, mount points containing interesting uh, characters. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go as far as separating them by null bytes because that is also not standardized, but yeah. This command uh, uses the libxo support in the existing mount command. I have to run it with dash v because otherwise sometimes some file systems are invisible. Mm -hmm. Like a null fs hidden under another mount point or so, which has to be cleaned up. And that way I can um, have it use the order reported by mount, which we mount, uh, which lists mount points in the order they have been mounted, and just reversing this list of mount points and then filtering it uh, unmounts all of these file systems. Yes, I even unmount the uh, roots of the jail for a second there, or for a fraction of a second if everything works reasonably well, uh, but. I think that this is a way to handle this because uh, if you dedicate a mount point to it, so it wouldn't unmount it if uh, you have a UFS file system and the jail is just a directory because then it wouldn't be under this prefix mm -hmm. and stuff like this. So, so to make sure that you tier, uh, wipe all runtime state, don't wipe file systems, but and mount them and mount them again to get the system into a clean minimal state and then build up the state the user requested. Um, yeah. And Jamie, uh, you're right, the um, jail command has a lot of similarity with a simple, um, with a simple um, shell. And one of the things uh, which would help get us uh, closer to uh, item potency would be to add basically support for a precondition and then if met, if not met, so that you basically have an if else there in the language. So basically, if this mount point is available or if this interface exists, do this, otherwise do this. Uh, because turning right the jail get... configuration file into a programming language uh, yeah, seems would... a little more than really the direction we should go. So, so the I, thing I, is that here, here's I the would thing, argue though. against uh, adding support for looping or recursion, yeah. while recursion is kind of there already by running a sub command, but uh, I wouldn't add and anything which makes it possible uh, to have as long as each command each started command uh, runs within reasonable time. It should mm -hmm. always finish. There should be no way to do um, arbitrary back jumps or um, unbounded loops or something, but uh, support for these kinds of preconditions is cleaner because what I have seen others do as well is that you get the exact same feature, but in Aglia, we implement it by inverted condition or and as in a shell. So what you get is hooks that look like which is hooks which look like this in shell a lot. Wow, that's weird. Uh, because you have to make sure that whatever state, something like create this uh, WireGuard interface, which will fail if it already exists. So you have to make run some command, which verifies that the state is not already reached, or if the state is there, destroy it. Or you find, uh, I've also found myself, and after what I found others doing it, list all the interfaces, filter out the one I want, 
and then pipe it into uh, xargs if config uh, placeholder destroy. So mm. things like this. Uh, by the way, in in my in 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 my Oberon implementation that I'm writing, you know, by using the syscalls mm -hmm. directly, I ended up not having hooks this way at all. I talked with a couple of my friends, and we all agreed that it would make more sense if we basically, uh, you know, we should always pass a file to the to our new command where. Uh, in the file that it could be a shell script, could be a Python program, whatever you want, but it mm -hmm. would have some exported environment variables that you can use yes. in order to decide on what to do. Uh, I mean, technically you can also pass it a command, you know, but like the model should be more like that. And like with in the default mode, it would have a default file that would do the mm -hmm. default things uh, kind, kind of scenario. And uh, it, it, it does sound a lot cleaner, although, you know, with UCL, it's, 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 it's a lot easier because if you have, you know, exec full three times, it automatically becomes an array and you can do a lot of more things there. Uh, so In, um, in uh, libucl, you can also uh, include the contents of a file as a mm -hmm. uh, key in the current object. Yeah. Or as an array element, I think. I have never used it that way, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 you can. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. And import I've also file. found that oftentimes you want to basically rerun the, uh, you want to do, perform a few simple hooks under the same precondition. So having basically a precondition and then a list of hooks to run if this condition holds true and a list of conditions to run if it doesn't hold true. So, for example, to work around the limitations of uh, the FS tab. I ended up with something really um, an ugly clutch. I'm sorry to say, something like this. Oof. And then um, I would do basically this. Hmm. And yes, this really uh, does uh, work. But as you can see, the uh, the fs tab variable includes a here doc string mm -hmm. to be, and at that point I'm abusing the shell uh, to work around the limitations of the format. Um, and the other thing which uh, we're just working on is support for splitting this file up because it gets a bit large. So right now, what I usually do is I use Ansible to uh, template out each jail and then use the Ansible assemble module to collect it back into a single file because the uh, jail command doesn't really work with that well if you always have to pass in the per jail uh, jail.conf. Um, yeah. So this is what I've been doing and uh, I found out that despite all of the new uh, features you can theoretically uh, build with uh, the support gained in FreeBSD 13.2 for mounting files in via NullFS instead of directories uh, so that you can have something like a single file as rc.com for the jail or something mounted into the jail, it quickly breaks down because uh, tons of tools from sysrc to uh, editors expect to use a temporary file and then do an atomic rename rather than mutate the file in place. And you can't re uh, move away or move a new file. So you could, for example, copy into this uh, new file, but you can't move a file into this mount point because move would by default write to a temp file and then atomically rename the temp file to the new name, which fails, of course, because it's a mount point. And so sadly, the and it doesn't play nice with UnionFS because normally every file lives in exactly one directory, and uh, which is and it has its own mount point with UnionFS. So, but UnionFS has a check if a file exists basically on, on both layers. 
it checks the write permission. And if you have a read-only file system underneath this uh, single file nullfs, uh, the UDNFS code checks the parent directory, which is a read-only file system. It says, no, the directory, not of the level of the file, but one level up basically is uh, refuses you to uh, do anything. So you have a writable file with write permission for everyone, I tested it, and uh, mounted there as a writable mount point. But if there's a union involved, union FS underneath, it just uh, refuses any attempt to write to this file because uh, it says, nope, the one of the containing directories on one of the two layers uh, refuses you. Yeah. Which is because the uh, union FS code uh, just didn't foresee this. Uh, but uh, in doing all of this, I found out that I, as long as, uh, as I have ZFS, I need neither NullFS nor uh, union FS to do everything I want. Because yeah, I have a uh, Go ahead. thanks to the way uh, the previous default system hierarchy is organized, I can split it up into multiple data sets uh, on those boundaries and get the desired uh, semantics so that I can have a base jail, uh, which is a clone, but it is only ever used read only. And even within the jail can't diverge, so I don't get the need to rebase. Uh, then I get copies for the slash etc file system, which is kind of also what I want. And I just can have a, a US Air local mount point with the applications. So, and most ports uh, play nice and don't modify the anything outside of the uh, US Air local prefix. There are a few exceptions. In that case, yes, you have to basically collect the and even if they do that, they are mostly kind enough to uh, have their own directory. So you basically have a very small set, which is normally just one uh, ZFS data set per collection of installed ports you want to package. And then you can mount these read only into the jail and uh, call it a day. So you get the convenience of potentially rebasing in the future. Uh, uh, and updating applications, but the state lives on in uh, a disjunct set of ZFS data sets so that you never have to rebase the uh, root FS unless you demand a writable uh, base file system. In that case, okay, uh, you're not really using containers. Uh, by the way, Jan, I mean, I love your ideas, don't get me wrong. But oh hmm? boy, it is not developer friendly. What is not developer friendly? I mean, uh, this is very you know easily accessible. All of these ideas to us, you know, like you know, just like we can casually talk about them on having read only data sets and mounting. And I keep thinking that even if we have all of these uh, things implemented in the system. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet, it will be very hard to show this to a developer and say, hey, look how cool this is. You know, their reaction is going to be like, wait, like, you know, it's like, um, can I achieve this with Docker? I think I can, you know, so. that Yes, you can. I, I know, I know. But the, my, my, pro, my, my worry is, how can we not only make it accessible uh, to, let's call it sysadmins, sure. But at the same time, in a way that developers can look at this and say, oh, this is not only accessible to sysadmins, but also developers, and it can be very easily used. Do you get what I'm saying? Um, yeah. The way forward to get there is opinionated enough tooling so that you don't get overwhelmed by decisions you have to make uh, along the way to get it up and running. So you yes. have to have, you can have lots of bells and, uh, bells and whistles, but they must not be needed to get it up and running. And right now they are. Yeah. And what you can do is you can ship example configurations, which only have to be applied. So that, for example, it should be easy 
to uh, get a FreeBSD 13 uh, base jail. And right now what I did, uh, we can argue about how it should look, but I did something like this. Uh, wait, wait. So it's too long. I have okay. to use an external link. Um, the, uh, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, I keep I keep coming back to the idea of, you know, I mean, you've used Docker. You can do like, what was it? Like Docker build dot, and then, you know, it's all done, you know? So um, I keep going back to that concept rather than a system administration point of view, dividing the system into multiple sections concept. But I mean, they are different things. If we have this lower parts all done, implementing the higher level of that is going to be a lot more easier, of course. Yeah. Uh, where, where, where did you send the link? Oh, you didn't send it yet. Okay. Uh, I just had to collect it. Okay. So, uh, uh, oh, this is a very long. Okay. So, uh, yeah, main the, domain, NAS root, et cetera, et cetera. The, the okay. roots on top are as simple. Um, So I couldn't use a dot in the jail name because that get, then gets split and tweeted yes. off and treated as a jail ID. Yes. Uh, so, th and I can then do things. Uh, have Have you had a look at Jailer? This is exactly what Jailer does. <laughs> no, I haven't looked at it. So to say, and uh, for example, for. Uh, before I finished the FreeBSD 13.2 and before I moved, I can show that I did for the uh, 13. Uh, the patches are so then basically pulled in uh, like this. The idea is that I can specify a base by basically a major, minor, and patch level. Mm -hmm. And oops, sorry. I'll try to I'll try to paste this. It's not going to be pretty. Yeah, so I can make it. This work is what the updating. Of course, this is a bit. Uh, as I say, it was a prototype and a clutch, but it kind of rocks the problems. You have to know basically the latest patch level because, as far as I know, there's no way to check out a specific. Uh, patch level with a FreeBSD update. And I want to revisit this for- Sorry, I didn't uh, get that part, go again. Okay, uh, the FreeBSD update command yeah. can only pull the latest patch level for the installed release. Okay. As far as I know, I can't say, yeah, well, I want to um, only for, let's say I want to have a reproducible build problem and I want to take a FreeBSD 13.1 uh, and go to uh, patch level five instead of seven. All uh, right. And you can't I, do that as, as far as I know. Yeah, you, you can, can only update to the current patch level for your selected yes. Uh, release. Yes. Yeah, you can do it manually by hand, you know, like there's mm -hmm. a way to do that, but with the, not, the, well, not with the FreeBSD update command. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this but is so, this maybe a lot easier once I move uh, the jail prototype to. Um, um, it's a, it's your um, microphone is open. So um, once I move to uh, base packages, uh, I want to check if I can handle it that way. Uh, checking out a specific patch level. Yeah, so that's okay. what I've spent my time on. And that I'm not proposing that this is a good idea for a normal user to run, but mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, explore the uh, edges of the current design and see where it breaks down. So, I think I think, would be, now, I think it would be a very good beta user of the new jail command that I'm writing in Oberon. But yeah, that that would be a good way to see. Um, so so here's another idea because um, uh, you've played with both Beehive and and FreeBSD. Um, so and of Beehive and and jails. Do you think that there is a flawed 
a pro uh, and some kind of an issue with the demonized model that Beehive does because I couldn't see anything that I could would go wrong. disagree that there are um, alternative models to accomplish the same because there's such a vast difference between the uh, responsibility of the proposed jail demon or what uh, the Solaris zone uh, process does to what the Beehive process does that it doesn't really compare the design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so what happens is that a Beehive guest can only run normal instructions, but every time you do IO, um, you take a VM exit exception in the CPU, the kernel captures the state required and makes it and works up the user space process by marking the VMM device ready. And then it does something like, for example, disk emulation, network interface emulation, or certain support operations like deciding if a certain register value should be, for example, how should this uh, register, which would normally leak host state to the guest be filtered. Things like this. Um, and so the process really does work on behalf of the guest kernel. And the jail isn't really supposed to do that, the jail demon. Oh, no. It's supposed you got me to wrong. Re respond uh, to state changes, not to have a I'm, I'm, I'm RPC channel uh, for so, IO. The jail I'm, demon I'm, does not. Read yeah, no, no, the I'm, file I'm, I'm, on behalf of the uh, jail processes. No, I'm I'm talking from no, I'm talking from a I'm talking from a architectural point of view because one of the proposals was having jail D as in a single demon that monitors all the jails, right? Oh, but um, but but the Illumus model was having a single process supervisor that manages their own. Uh, zone, right? So, um, so my idea was, what if we had the jail? Sure, let's call it jailctl a jailctl that it gets demonized, but it's monitoring only a single jail, not all the jails. Neither of those would be what I would uh, recommend. I would recommend mm -hmm. having something like uh, more like the postfix model, okay, uh, or the dark like... model. You have a long-running parent process. Uh, which is supposed to basically be there to make jail, jailing available as a service, it passes maybe the configuration unless you have one per jail that can be argued either way. But if you want any global non-jail specific configuration, it should be passed by this process. And then it would fork off a child process per jail. And that child process would then be only responsible for a single jail so that you get a tree of processes with a simple parent process with a very limited scope of responsibilities and a per jail supervisor, let's say, process, which is responsible for this jail only at runtime. Uh, similar to how you would use a daemon tools, run it or S6 to set up a Three of supervised processes where the root process is only responsible for making sure the individual supervisors are up and running. And then the individual supervisors respond to these requests or watch for event. And if we set it up correctly, this um, the supervisors would be basically the place where something like a Solaris style brand could exist where you would in the configuration file basically specify which implementation of this jail supervisor should handle commands for this jail. So that you could uh, um, have this and it would then respond to commands, uh, things like start the jail, stop the jail, uh, maybe even get reports in that something has happened as a command, an asynchronous one in that case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's actually a very nice model as well. So, you know, uh, and the Beehive Zone model, a demon per jail, a jail D model, a demon for all jails, and the post fix model, a long running jail 
who export well, the facility. The supervisor case. model, something like Demon Tools does this, where you have a one, basically you have a directory of defined services. Uh, you have a scanner which scans for this directory and the old implementation, it just pulls the directory every five seconds to notice changes because there didn't exist any uh, event notification API for directory modifications. Uh, and it still doesn't exist in all corner cases like NFS mount points mm -hmm. shared by several systems. But um, in that case, you have this directory uh, and it notices the changes, however it does it. And if a new service uh, is discovered, it starts the supervisor process, it just forks an XX into the supervisor mm -hmm. and then runs this. And we could, you may even want to have a double indirection where you have a, a jail demon and then a jail supervisor per, and then run the brand. Basically, the brand would be the hook more or less where you have a standardized uh, system provided jail supervision demon, which run starts the configured brand in response to the events it's noticed. Okay. So that would be the way I'm leaning there. Basically, it would run the com the brand as a one one shot command to be run to completion for every event the brand is supposed to respond to, for example, you instruct the per jail supervisor to start it up and it would fork and exec the brand and expect the brand to run to completion, do its setup stuff like the existing jail hooks would, and you could run it uh, and you could write it in a proper language. You don't have to use a quoted shell script thing in there. Yeah. Um, or found at least one configuration where someone had jail hooks, uh, which just type base64 encoded uh, blobs into Python to run Python, mm -hmm. embedded Python scripts, which is just- uh, um, J Jamie, terrible. as a jail author, how do you feel about these possible models of supervision? Is that the right English word? word? Yeah, supervision. Yeah. That's Jamie is muted. Don't know if he's still listening to my ramblings. He is muted, yes. Yeah. I was, I was listening from out of the room, so uh, had to get back in here. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> did you catch uh, everything we were discussing or did you miss out on something? I um, caught the, uh, the general thing over the last few minutes, but probably about... The, the question itself, I, I missed that. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the possible... last week we um, had this recorded long two hour session on how Solaris uh, zones and their branding works. And it has a long running process. And um, right now, Andrenik wanted your uh, input on uh, the alternative design I proposed where you have a long running parent process, which forks off a child process or maybe forks in XX, a child process for each jail responsible for supervising a specific jail for its entire lifetime. Okay, and I missed more than I thought. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that process would, uh, to support the lowest like branding, basically, you would be able to have, have it, in response to the requested state transitions like start, stop, recover something, prepare, all the states basically, all the types of exec hooks available in jail.com would at the very least become uh, basically po potential invocations of the brand. And the brand would then get this command and be expected to run to completion to respond to this command. But the jail supervisor process would stay around and there may be new basically commands which get run by the jail supervisor on the brand in response to changes like for example so I'd so, say the so, so so the basic idea is the the from what we learned from zones 
is that they're doing it similar to what we do to Beehive, where you know you do zones create, mm -hmm. for example, and it ends up you know running a single process for that zone in the background that's monitoring the state and making sure that everything is all right. The other idea that when I was speaking with Mecca, his idea was JLD, which is a single daemon that manages all the jails, right? So you're talking with the daemon via, let's say, a socket, TCP, UDP. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, th that, that's, that, I'm wondering, yeah, about the single yeah. process. And I, I remember, I did overhear yeah, you mentioning that distinction. Yeah. So yeah, what, yeah. what's the um, advantage of a, pro a per jail process? So uh, uh, the advantage is that uh, the processes the responsible for a single jail, for example, can be join a, a sub jail and you get a nested tree, or no, they not, can not just that. Run not as that. a specific user. The, the the actual advantage of that would be if you uh, versus having a single demon is you know the the Erlang philosophy is that if one of them dies, the others don't die, right? So if one of your if, if in case of JLD, the master JLD, if the master JLD died, now your actual supervisor is like dead and your jails are running and you don't know about their state. But with the zones model where you have one process in the background per jail, if one of them went corrupt, the others wouldn't be affected because, you know, there are completely separate processes. But uh, then do you need a master process to uh, track which processes are running or not? Then? So that's that's the point that I was missing. <laughs> and if that one dies, then everything dies. Um, so that's the one that I would no, we put another process in to monitor that one. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> there's, wait, there's a one. solution to this madness. I know you you're kind of trolling, but there are two possible clean solution and ugly workarounds. So, so, so the clean also... solutions is root the uh, the process tree in the init process uh, ID one, and if it dies, the kernel panics. So this process is always uh, around because otherwise the kernel would have panicked. The alternative <laughs> is fix quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, then, that's correct. <laughs> is, uh, no. The other thing is that such co you want to keep the code small. You don't want this insanity, which is launch D or system D, where you have uh, tens of thousands of lines of uh, PID1 init process code. Mm -hmm. For example, I've seen system D kill the system if you, uh, back then Fusion IO cards were new uh, and VME flash. If you have too fast of a root file system, upgrading your system crashes partway through because you change the root file system, which is modified, uh, watched for changes faster than system D can consume yeah, the I notify event queue. And because they copy and paste it, they are uh, I notify. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe let's try and keep on track here. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, but yeah. the, the idea is to keep the parent process so simple, this shared parent process, that uh, there is maybe. Obviously, no bug. You can basically have it uh, only allocate resources on uh, lo reloading and maybe on jail creation, and that's it. And it, otherwise, it would only run uh, a finite state machine. So mm. um, interestingly, the, 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 the third model that you said, Jan, was the postfix model. And for those who are not aware, so if you are running Postfix, or actually most of email servers are like that. So like Postfix usually would listen on multiple ports, let's say on 25 for SMTP and some other for, mm -hmm. port for submission. But it, it's not a single process. There's a master process, which I think they also ca call the name of the process master or postmaster, yes. right? Postmaster, yeah. right? But then for each port, because they are actually completely different implementations as well, they run a separate process for each. And I do like this idea because it would also give us the ability that um, you have, I'm just you know throwing the, the names here. Mm -hmm. You have JLCTL, which you use mm -hmm. to talk with this JLD, that's the master process. Mm -hmm. And you can now talk with it by default. Let's say it would be a socket. 
but okay. you can also modify it and now make it, you know, uh, IPv4, TCP, and also maybe even mm -hmm. SSL. And your your code is still tiny because it's basically just so, a um... working server, right? But then each for every jail you create, it would have a child process. But that also means that if one of the child processes do go corrupt for some reason, it would still not affect the other child processes. Uh, that, and then that, you could talk to JLD, but you could also talk directly to a particular jail's host ex process. My, exactly. So, so let's say hmm. I would say JLCTL list. I'm talking with JLD, and JLD is just you know it's it's a CRUD. Now it's a fancy CRUD that's just showing me the appropriate information as I need to go. And with this will also um, make the modifying process simpler, right? Because we know what the state it is in. So when we are modifying mm -hmm. the jail, the JLD knows exactly what to modify. It would become more, what was the word that you used, Jan? I'm, I'm, I'm omnipotent. I can't say that word. No, I, omnipotent. Um, omnipotent. No, I didn't and potency is what I used yeah. before, but that's in a different, that doesn't apply here. And uh, what okay. I argued for is that the uh, each basically type of process should only do one thing and that thing shouldn't be too complex. So the parent is only the master or well, let's take a name. We should probably start with a name which doesn't uh, evoke uh, too many negative connotations, but the uh, the scanner or loader or whatever. Warner. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it would fit. Uh, uh, yeah. No, the warden is already taken by a jail manager, so that's not really available anymore. Even if its project is kind of, but yeah. Um, so you have your, I don't know, call it the Department of uh, of Justice or something. No, that, or yeah, your uh, judge or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the judge throwing things into jail. How about that? The judge key. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you have that thing, and it is only responsible for reading the configuration and starting the child processes. Maybe do some IPC with the child process, but it is basically it has a one-to-many relation with the jails. And then each uh, jail supervisor has a one-to-one -one relation with one jail. You don't have all of these complex uh, struct, uh, state to track in each process, so you have less chances to get it wrong. Um, does this one make sense? But, but you have way? more machinery to set up in the beginning. Does, does, so, does, so I had does, two does, questions which we've been looking for a little while. Um, I would so, call it the, the uh, judge D yeah. and then the jail D or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Uh... Yeah. No, naming things is hard. So, so two questions. The, the f first thing here is, what is the problem multiple processes are, is going to solve? Is it a problem we have today? So are we designing um, future, are we solving future problems? That's one question. Yes. And the, the second one is, um, <laughs> the purpose well, it was more just a clarification. From last week, the purpose of the Solaris zones per process model is because it does a lot of work. And that is why they want to isolate it because it's keeping track of IO and a bunch of other things. And we don't do that. We have um, RCTL to do that for us. So putting my devil's advocate hat on, if mm -hmm. I, my original sort of reason for wanting to have a, a demon was that I could have one thing to query that says, give me the state of all the jails because I want to do something with the, um, the, the total list of that to put information mm -hmm. to a load balancer, to compare this with stuff from another machine. And when I have that state offloaded to multiple child processes, now that's much trickier. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So Which I, I think we've got to have a clear, I, a a clear idea process. about... Well, uh, I'm just saying, and... we need to have an idea of what our use case is and what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, I'm not saying that either model is wrong. I'm not, is, the, um... I'm not the developer to, to do that sort of thing. But um, for me, the purpose of the demon is to have an accurate view at any one time of the state of the jails to be able to use that collective information. Um, yeah. For people that are running thousands of jails, there are some systems out there that do this. Mm -hmm. Will those extra processes be heavy? Will that be a problem in itself? Um, it shouldn't be because uh, 
They are tiny processes with very little state to them. So you yeah. only have the share, shared mappings well. of a few kilobytes of code, read only read execute mappings, and you basically only have a tiny heap and a single stack. So that seems so, reasonable. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the only thing there is if we lose that process, um, how would it reacquire just, its state? Yeah. So anyway, those are the two. All, those are the two questions I had. I've. We can learn from existing production demons like Dovecot and Postic that if you lose the master, uh, you clean up. So you mm. kill it, the, the processes and start again, which is reasonable because root shouldn't go around uh, sending random signals around to random PIDs. If you do that, yeah, okay. But in the way you can even handle this because the will you if you pass the child process a process descriptor to itself it can make it available to retrieve this process descriptor through a unix domain socket in a directory of sockets one socket per jail and if you then retrieve <laughs> this file descriptor you can attach to it Put it yeah, in your event loop and uh, supervise a process which you have no relationship uh, in the process uh, tree. In the process tree, otherwise. yeah. Uh, so you can basically, this may be interesting for special purpose um, control planes, things like uh, something like Nomad or something to do. If you have a fancy nomad integration with it. But you're getting into all of that, what most of us probably consider wrong with Kubernetes and the over engineering beyond any uh, reason. So, does, does this model that I draw, draw make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it would uh, look yeah. like this. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, let me open the uh, Beehive uh, document. Uh, so the jails document that explains why. You know, it would it. be like a jail D that has mm. jail system D. Ha 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 ha. Just you know. No no. Uh, let me. Uh, a jail sock. You know, jail. You know, IPv fourteen. No, no, uh, what's you know? the jail sock process for? I actually thought what's about your that. Your socket jail. So, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so I was thinking in this order is the interface for, for each one. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, to make don't the code start small. A inter the interface belongs to the process being interfaced with. So he, you don't he, want to go through. He, here's my thought. My thought in this because I, I I did work a bit on OpenBSD. Um, they did a very good idea in the sense that, uh, for example, their what's it called, NTP demon. Even like in order to maintain a proper security, what um, they ended up doing is the the process that sets the time and the process that is connected to the internet are all different, right? It, it, uh, so that would allow a, a scenario where if your IPv4, so here's my, my penetration testing hat on. Uh, the IPv4 TLS, if it's, if it's in the same process as the parent, I could easily find a way to DOS or DDoS it. I could easily find a way to DOS it if there's a bug. But if it was a forked process, then I can, you know, I, if it's a forked process, if I try to DOS it, the, the child process will die, but it will not affect the actual parent process. So even um, though you're exposing it to IPv4, you're still in a very secure environment that you will not be able to get, uh, you know, a, 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 DOS, a DOS attack, you know? So that's my only train of thought for having the sockets in a separate process as well. Um, VLD supervisor. Yeah. The, the nice thing you can do here is you can have a directory of sockets and no, no, no. use the connect. You're, 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 you're talking about the, the oh. way that I would talk with the jail itself. I'm talking of something like you have JLD, right? And here I have JLCTL dash dash host equals I don't know full bar buzz am right which is running for uh, what is that supposed to do so a jlc command is a will uh, be 
used to uh, send commands, but the idea would be basically to have, if you target a jail, you would uh, enter a direct, have a open, uh, either open or some other way, acquire a file descriptor to the directory of uh, sockets, and then use the connect add to connect to the supervisor for this jail, and then you have a connection to it. No, 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 no. You're you're talking about the jails. I'm not talking about the jails. Yes. I'm talking about oh, you're parent, talking about the jail pro the, the the parent JLD process, right? How is the user communicating mm -hmm. with this daemon? Through a Unix domain socket is my idea. Right. Okay. So what if that Unix domain socket was also a IPv4 socket, a TCP socket? Um for some of the things I'm envisioning that wouldn't work because they de depend on file descriptor passing, but you could proxy that basically and have something act on behalf of this. Uh, um, and yes, uh, exposing this API as an API would be interesting exactly. and useful, but I would want to have some kind of Something like S pipe D or something uh, handle this. So basically, you are you familiar with S tunnel or S pipe D or similar tools? Yes. Yeah. So, so you what, have what some is kind of uh, Jan? encrypting and sorry. Yeah, yeah. Take a look at the link I sent from Florian Webster because Webster because it covers exactly this, which is what Antonik is already thinking of, and this proof set uh, model for both no, of these things is, is that sort of You're structure. You're talking about two is different things. It doesn't. Uh huh. Um, so let's take the OpenBSD MTP daemon you used as an example. Um, they partition the, um, the functionality of the daemon into talking to the outside network and parsing the messages into computing information based off the past messages and into updating the uh, kernel state. So they uh, break it up in all things like the, um, the mail even, all post even. They break it up into different types of um, processes. And basically each only has a limited attack surface. In OpenBSD, they sometimes even go as far as running uh, one uh, service as a daemon with multiple child processes running under different user IDs. They do this in their network daemons where you have one daemon which is responsible for writing to the kernel routing table in the net, uh, BGP daemon or OSPF daemon. You have a process responsible for keeping the uh, adjacency to each neighbor and basically establishing connections, sending keep alive if there, if there is no other traffic and parsing these sometimes rather complex wire formats into a simpler format. And then you have the route decision engine process, which is also their way of getting multi-core performance improvements because now you have one uh, process with one thread handling the event loop and a different process doing the heavy computation. And if you have a BGP daemon and your most important peer dies and you have to recompute half a million routes, uh, you don't want to uh, suffer the same kind of um, death spiral as Quagger does, where because it's all happening in one thread of one process, because you lost one important PGP neighbor, now you're losing them all because you're recomputing uh, routes until you have missed the keep alive uh, timeouts for the other PGP neighbors. And you enter a terrible death spiral where because one of your peers died, now all of them died and then you oscillate up and down. And once your more important peers come back up, uh, you recompute lots of routes and you lose them again. So once you have brought your system past this, this li the limitations of this flawed design, it becomes inherently unstable and won't recover. And open 
BSD avoids this because there will always be a process only responsible for uh, keeping the protocol session alive. And if it ever gets compromised, because it does the parsing, um, you're limited to a process with low resource limits, with a dedicated user ID. These days it's pledged and uh, unveiled so that it can't even fork a new child process. It can't exec. It can only basically uh, establish new network connections, okay? Or maybe I think it even has to request them. Yeah, it does have to request them because it wants to bind new sockets. But that's the OpenBSD PrivSAP framework or the uh, UMSG or IMSG, IMSG is it called? Uh, Uh, is a framework we're using, uh, which I, and this is not what I'm proposing. Here you basically have only the parent process and the JLD process, but the parent doesn't have different types. Every jail is the same to it. Does that make sense? Uh, you could even argue that you want to handle the configuration parsing off to a child process, which is a uh, basically jails. It would run a, ch a child. Uh, um, something like this, and it would fork this off. and would get a, a NV list back to, to define a jail. One NV list per, so that it is only a dumb service. It doesn't handle even its own configuration. It only starts the process to set it up. This is also useful because it keeps the uh, pages already mapped in the parent process to the uh, supervisor processes even lower. So it reduces the overhead of forking other processes off if you do the heavy lifting, like reading UCL or something, or reading a database, doing whatever you have to do. Um, if you I, hand I, this I like, off to a dedicated I like, loader. I like this, I like this model. I do like this model. I mean, uh, the interesting part about this model is that it could be implemented, you know, separately. Does that make sense? Like someone can start working on the JLD supervisor right now and then- Yes, exactly. The, if you have yeah. a stable API boundary or protocol, you can replace the implementation. Uh, J Jamie, how do you feel about this if you're around? I, this is details. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to keep a uh, clear picture right now of what is kernel and user space, but what, you know, what are the user spaces under user multiple space. processes is, I mean, you know, this, these are decisions that need to be made, but I'm not sure that they really are on, on my end of things. The thing is that the existing, uh, Jack, come on, what the only thing I would, as a reasonable, actionable thing, request of it to improve would be to uh, change, to become more idempotent in how, the way it applies the abstractions. A few little helper commands here and there to be run as hooks, and it would be mostly fine. And you can kind of use the jail command for persistent jails. I mean, a lot of ways like this, and if you maybe stick around then at the end. But that's not how jails are normally used. So the only thing there, which the existing jail 8 command has to change in my opinion, would be to uh, do more to be resilient to failures and to uh, do more recovery by default. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one thing, uh, by the way, that uh, process tree I, you showed there, you show an hmm? init thing. Um, so I've what? played around before with actual per jail and init processes. Might be something we want to do sometime. Um, the question is, what's the what's the job of the per jail init process? Normally, the init process uh, in FreeBSD uh, is, uh, in my opinion, a bit too complex as um, state machine responsible for responding to uh, get TTY or similar services. And also, just as the, um, the process the accounting before. database. So the UTX file. How about this? You know, you might want to just run Nginx as is. You might want to run Postgres as is. You might want to run a complete system. You know, so I, I don't yeah. think yeah. that in it possible. Yeah, there's, there's definite things, different things you want to do. Of course, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. normally a jail would have an empty uh, or an effectively empty ETC uh, device file because none of the devices listed in there are visible in a jail. Oh, well, true. So the only, I mean, it the does only not thing need to have could PPYs. Do is what I do in my production setup. For example, I use the etc rise file to run uh, the parent process of a third party supervision tree under supervision of the FreeBSD init so that I don't have to replace the uh, FreeBSD init system. Instead, I just move everything I care about uh, into it, but left the FreeBSD in it and, and RC.D scripts with all their limitations and flaws, but they're there, they're supported by ports, and they bring up the system to the point where it's uh, usable and all of the services I care about, I move into S6 RC or run it supervision, and then the parent process is run through the etc TTYs file. Uh, so that maybe if it dies, gets restarted by init, and init will try restarting it uh, until init dies, which is until the system shuts down. Hmm. That's a big trick. Yeah. And normally, because I only want to have one per init process, I just tell init that it should supervise the def null file. Um, because that's always available, and so uh, I can just use this because the file you list there, the device, doesn't even have to be a device. It's just something which gets passed, which by convention is a device name to get it right, or XDM or some other login to interface. Yeah, so just circling back to where this discussion started, I'm still not clear mm -hmm. of the trade-off between a single parent, like a single JLD, for example, a peer process jail, and the reason, and the sort of per process supervisor, and the reason for that is in the Illumos model, mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of work to be done per jail, but in the FreeBSD one, the kernel is doing almost everything anyway. So... I'm adding all of these extra processes. It doesn't appear initially to be a significant security boundary. Um, and while we view this as hierarchical, the jail process, the, the, the actual jail itself, is not a child process of a supervisor, is it? So I'm not quite um, sure the what, type process what, what are we trading off here? In so far as it, uh, if, uh, the desired state of the jail is up and it dies, it gets restarted. Or the brand gets, the brand uh, would be run the child process of the supervisor inside the host, not inside the jail normally. So the yeah. brand so would I'm get run. Speaking terms, not if it's a logical supervisor, it's a strict child process in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the question here is, yes. there's no strict child parent relationship from, from a process tree perspective here. And what is the advantage of having this supervisor process today? Because right now today, you can use etc RC to do exactly this already. Yeah, that's my argument. What, why, what, what is the parent bringing that uh, we don't already have today? What's the thing we need, the, the, the user-facing function, where this becomes okay, um, well, the primary thing I thought about was... Uh, 
a consistent look at the configura configured state, basically. If I have a global, not a jail specific jail.conf in some form or other, I don't want to pass it again and again. I want to have a consistent look at it, so passed into an NV list or something to be looked at by the jail C. Uh, sure, so but you still don't need a separate process for that. What I called a supervisor in this example. Yeah, so so that's still the case here. Uh, let's say, mm -hmm. so I can't remember, like a few weeks ago, I tried with Lua creating how many jails can I create a second, and it's a ridiculously fast number, right? Sure. Um, that matter. And even if, um, even if I have to read once the jail.conf or the configuration file for a jail, and this single jail demon loads that, mm -hmm. um, that is still not really a significant amount of effort. That's not going to be done um, very often. And then that configuration is all held. So the question comes back here again, what is the, the functionality that you go, I can't get this in a single process and I need to have these extra supervisors um, here? So I still I, don't see it. Maybe I should explain how I ended up at that point. So I started off with the idea even before the uh, talk last uh, week with the uh, idea of, yes, there should be a single jail, pro there should be a long-lived process uh, watching out for state transitions. So something like uh, the DEFD basically for jails. Yeah. So that it's always there waiting and in a lot of ways, it kind of has to hook into DevD to get the, um, if you load the right bots, uh, kernel module to get the events per jail. And because only one consumer can read the uh, DevCTL device, yeah. Okay. Um, in that case, you need a kind of this, um, you kind of have to proxy the events for DevD. But so I started with a single process then. I've uh, learned about how Solaris does branding and thought, well, maybe a process per brand, okay. But I wanted to avoid having to have a, a single kind of implementation only. So that you could only have the brands implemented in the centralized daemon which becomes part of a base system or something. Because at that point you get something like, oh, uh, this kind of, this service type isn't defined in system D, so you can't have it. Uh, or this, mm -hmm. uh, this notification interface. So, uh, okay, I want to have a process per jail, but I didn't uh, go to the just one uh, process. I'm also coming from the mindset of running most things on supervision. So I kind of look out for um, truly demonized process and want to avoid putting in, in a design because uh, they uh, are annoying to manage and supervise and they are always mm. fragile by design because who watches for the watcher? If you organize them into a tree, you uh, get an answer to this question. Even if the root of the tree is dangling, if you keep it simple enough, it isn't a real world concern and you can root it in the init process like I showed in the chat, where you mm. put a dummy uh, entry into a, a etc device on the host to have the init process run it as soon as interactive logins start. So once the etcrc script has run to completion, the system goes from the starting up state to the multi-user stage of the runtime, and then uh, you could do it that way. Mm. So, so I think again, this is boiling this right down to what is the key point, and the key point I took away from this is what you miss is the state machine view of it. Yeah, that's exactly. the key piece where you said I, 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 it's worth having something else. Exactly, I want to have it. Yeah, because for a like... supervising process, I, I, I think that's something that can sit inside the jail and the jail's user land. It's no, there's it a thousand the choices. The Stop. Or what kind of supervisor are you looking for? So something well, like if I have a process that I need to run in a jail my, uh, and I wanted to make sure it's up, then I'm going to put a supervisor process in to do that. Uh, that like belongs, let's see uh, a CD. 
um, will we'll do that or your TTY trick or supervise any, any one of those things. And that will keep the thing inside the jail running. If the jail crashes, that is a, that is a different question. Um, but for that, that process of the jail crashes, um, mm -hmm. then it will disappear. It will not be persistent. It will have um, whatever the reverse of persistent is. It will, it will have unpersisted. And it will disappear. Or, um... Yeah. And, and that state, that's not going to occur frequently. Um, and I'm quite happy still to have a single process managing all of that. Um, so again, I come back to this this this, this key well, point here, which is the reasons, what's the thing uh, that changes? And I think it's the state machine. You go, I need a state machine to do this. And then the the because the my my broader concern here is as soon as we implement all these processes, and I can see why they're 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 nice, then now we introduce a new problem, which is when I want to know the overall state of the system, I need to consult all these individual processes to do that. And the more jails I have, the worse that gets. And that's the trade-off that I see here. Um, so, for example, which jails exist? Which jails exist? Um, that is probably the main thing that I'm um, the directly The interested in view is. on which jail exists is still what JLS gives you. This is only a user space management view of things. The, none of right. this, what I'm proposing there, requires, as far as I see, any changes to the available system call interface. Mm -hmm. This is all just an alternative to the existing jail command or a jail manager doing, basically it would be a, a, just like a jail manager doing its own um, system calls or lib jail calls. Um, if it's written in C, there's no reason to rewrite this. So this the only thing I kind of wish to have for this is it basically depend because I see this, if it ever gets implemented, I see it starting out as a port, which may in a future timeline once get moved into base and imported, but mm. it shouldn't have to be part of base and start out there because it can't be done anywhere else. Because I think all of the uh, interface to do this without uh, busy rating and polling are there in FreeBSD. Some of them are a bit limited, so you have to design with these limitations in mind, but it should all be possible. Except for the thing that we, I may depend on the uh, jail uh, event kernel module. Uh, what, hmm. What's its name? Uh, Another one you mean, the K-mod um, that yeah. implements like mounts and unmounts and so forth, yeah. Not, uh, no, no, mounting and unmounting is already, doesn't require a special uh, K-mod. K-mod devs CTL is what it was called. Dev CTL yeah. jail K-mod. Yeah. Um, it tells me if a process attaches to a jail, if a jail just gets destroyed, things like that. So uh, DevD could be configured through etc DevD uh, configuration file. So it already has a modular configuration where it has a global file and also run loads of configurations from a directory of files. And it could just uh, basically notify the per jail process that, hey, your jail just died on you. It's time to run the brand and it doesn't have to uh, pull for that. It just gets the, it's basically, you would do it some similar like you would use a, uh, uh, the rate for interrupt on a energy um, efficient microcontroller application running bare metal. You have to support uh, spurious wake ups anyway, because there could be some other cause uh, other than the expected one where your chip woke up from sleep. Uh, and you basically just get a notification that it's, hey, it's time to reevaluate this uh, condition. That way you avoid the polling for the state change. Or you could have it always use persistent jails and uh, desynchronize uh, if anything uh, is um, unfriendly and destroys the jail from underneath it. Because uh, just because by convention you demand to be in charge of 
creation and destruction of this your jail ID uh, as process, this doesn't prevent root uh, in your env um, host or the, the same level of jailing uh, to send the same system call if it has the permission. Unless you add this kind of what I would like to see, but what we don't have is a jail descriptor type where you get a file descriptor for a jail so that you yeah. can put it in there. That would be really nice, but it's not necessary. I've looked a little into that. Uh, and the question I have with that is, what do you want a jail descriptor to communicate? Um, I want to have, uh, if I can, if I can, uh, if it's Christmas and I get to uh, write my wish list, the thing that's the most important thing is <laughs> jail destruction. Yeah. So if the, and the jail state, the thing like its parameters and so on, should live until the last file descriptor. So just because basically the jail is destroyed, its configuration state should still be there to be inspected. And okay. So that. Yeah, basically now, the things by jail state. Past the kernel should uh, the things I see if I run JLS dash uh, N basically. Okay. I want so yes, to if it's anything in JLS, that makes sense. Yeah, basically I still want to see it in JLS, even if it as let's call it dead or something a state. I want to see it state that it's dead. That's the most basic thing I want yeah. to do. Well, that's the yeah, that is thing kind I of would the, like the to dying see, state. It would make sense to uh, hold jails around in a dying state until the descriptors yeah. have let go of them. Mm. And that would simplify the job of the supervisor the process. Maybe it be even to the point that I would agree there is no point in having multiple processes. The well, there is, is that there, there is a problem with jail state in that a jail as we have jail state as we've been talking about has been two different things. For example, you know we've been going a lot over mounting errors and unmounting errors and what file systems are mounted and that's not the jail state at the kernel the level state. have nothing to do with the jail but exactly. they are still a jail state but it's yeah I'm, as far as the kernel, kernel interface they're not a jail state they are just something that happens to be running on a system that also has a jail so as long as you don't mm. want things like that to show up in a jail descriptor because the kernel right no, now doesn't no, no, know no. if you have put an it ip address in the there, interface that's... or if you've mounted a file system no no uh, i that's not what I'm wishing. For. The next thing I would like to see is uh, other events related to jails, for example, a process attaching via J, J, uh, uh, jail attach, maybe even the option of attaching to the jail through the file descriptor. So that I uh, have yes, a I would. That's jail an idea I had in mind. That even F, that you can do basically. right now through a jail ID, you should be able to do through a jail descriptor. And can yes. someone explain how that works? Sorry. The attaching um, well, via descriptor. The uh, so it's it's like process descriptors. I thought, except for yep. the big difference I noticed with process descriptors is that they are always created with a special kind of fork. But with jail descriptors, I would just uh, uh, just have something where you could get a descriptor for a jail. You know, with jail get, you know, there could be a descriptor parameter, and it brings you back a jail descriptor, and then you could pass it to jail set or jail attach or something. Um, instead of a jail ID, and then, it would be able to use the jail via that descriptor. And the other the, thing, sorry. And, sorry, and you, you, could use, you could pass the jail descriptor, for example, through a K event for, oh. for the thing, yeah. things that we're looking for here. And yes, that's I want where a K event, it, it can tell you Let the jail talk. is attached to and stuff like that. Okay, the big so, advantage of using these sort of descriptors is that you can pass it over a secure channel to a process that is restricted in some way that you yeah, know that that jail, right. you cannot, it cannot do anything else to other jails. Like right now, you get your, your, your root process, you figure out some way to sneak a different jail ID in and um, you put in jail ID zero and you won. And what we want here with a, with a descriptor is um, that becomes impossible because you have the descriptor, that's all you've got. And if you um, get another one, it will, it, it will, it will be invalid. Uh, I don't actually know how and, that works, but uh, yeah. And uh, if I get to push for the other thing which would be neat is to have anonymous jails similar to named FIFOs and anonymous pipes. 
So if you have some kind of CI build daemon or something, it shouldn't clutter my normal manually managed name. We have that already. Space. We have that already. Yeah. You can just pass the parameters in the command line. That's what I do. No, no, no. In JLS, you will still see it. Well, yeah, I, I don't know oh, that yeah. I want level right an anonymous now, jail any run... more than I'd want an anonymous process. <laughs> no, it yeah, I, I was going to say that. It could have a name collision. Where oh, that. I want to name a jail builder free, and the CI system wants to name it the same, and I, we can't have the same thing. So that, that's actually a very good point, uh, Jan. So in, in our build pipeline, we run, we run jails that mm -hmm. uh, have some kind of a scripts that we execute using jexec. And I didn't know this. You can just pipe anything that you want to jexec and it will you know, do a continuous execution of a, of a shell script, mm -hmm. apparently. So that was very helpful. But what we ended up doing is the, uh, the CI CD pipeline would create, for example, if we're creating our front end application, right? It would create something called front end dash and the job ID. So, you know, it would be 15, 16, mm -hmm. 20, and every time it would increase. And that would be, it doesn't have a config file, it's generated using the command line parameters. Uh, so, and it uh, obviously, yeah, I agree with Jamie from a security point of view. I do want to see them in JLS like always, and you can see that. And th that was mm -hmm. one of the most helpful ones. Mm -hmm. And apparently you can also do it in a way uh, where, so what we ended up having is um, instead of running bin s bin in it, uh, instead of that, we would run the, the build pipeline process itself. Right, so the the the, the command mm -hmm. that would build whatever that we wanted to be built. So you know, it would execute a script that does package and install this, run Elixir here, symlink there, run this NTP com uh, sorry the N npm command. Here's the artifact, put it in the specific directory that we you know is probably null mounted, and now we have whatever that we need. So yeah, no, I think anonymous jails already exist. It's just that you know you don't have a configuration for them. You create them using the command line, and it so, does all work fine. No, they don't exist because the true jail name is a jail ID. The true jail name is go again. I can Every jail has a jail ID. Jail. Yeah. Okay. okay. In the kernel, I can only have one jail with jail ID one. Okay. I'm not talking about the configuration file. The configuration file is a lot newer than the jail system calls. Uh, this started, I think, in free, which was a, was it FreeBSD eight dot two or was it nine zero where we got the current nicer jail command, uh, which even has a configuration file. For the first decade or so, jails didn't have a jail configuration file. They yeah. only had the configuration. Right, and they uh, didn't have a name at that point. Arguments. But you know, now they do, and the name, like the JID, the name must be unique. They're both yeah. required exactly. internal to be unique. That's the second namespace where you can collide. Wait, so, yeah. um, so, so you want them to have different JIDs, but the same name? Did mm -hmm. I get that right? No, neither of those. I want them to be anonymous. They may carry a name, but and the kernel may assign them a uh, jail ID because it requires one to track it and to put it in the structs and so on. But I want them this to be, I want them to be truly inferior and outside of the user space managed namespacing. Mm. So that uh, this is so basically I would have a, a jail a p uh, yeah jd uh, create or something or j some kind of uh, system call to create a jail file descriptor then I would perform ioctals or some some other system call on them probably ioctals to configure them. Uh, the jail to set things like, uh, what do I want to say? Is the allow flags and things like that. Okay. The, the VNet flag, the, uh, okay. all of yeah. these things you can really put into the kernel. Basically, what you can read back from JLS N right now, I would configure them. And then uh, either yeah, I would do an, a, a jail attach on the file descriptor to mm -hmm. run things in there, which also gets 
uh, kind of implicitly gets us uh, at least runtime unprivileged jails, where if you you never attach from a privileged process because you no longer should be required to be privileged to do a J attach for a file descriptor because file descriptors are supposed to be capabilities. And in that case, so if I have this file descriptor, it would also be very nice if it uh, is hooked into Capsicum so that I, you can limit with it with Caps right, which oh, yeah, already has I, support I, for I, I octet. So that I already I can... got lost. So what's the difference? Would, what would be the difference between a regular jail and an anonymous jail? Um, a regular jail, as it exists right now in the kernel, has okay. a jail ID and a jail name. Okay. And potentially a host name, but that's a thing doesn't have to be unique. Okay. But uh, and right now you have this in this namespace of integer starting at one mm -hmm. towards uh, up to two billions or so of potential jail IDs. You have okay. this this namespace of a flat namespace of jail names, okay. which are only limited to be strings not containing a, a few prohibited characters and limited in length to whatever is available in the kernel struct to track the name. And it's also required to be unique. Okay. Um, but let's say we get to a point where we have uh, unprivileged jailing available. And now you have two users, two developers developing on the same server and both of them run to run them the test suite, and okay. both of them you want to use the same jail names. Oh, I see, I see. So you and basically want the jail floats. name to not be unique. So multiple jails can have the same name. Basically, that... I want to the these jails to at least potentially have no assigned name unless I assign it one. I want it to start out anonymous and remain anonymous until I use an ioctl to assign a name to it. Oh, name, okay. Then well, it here, has a name and it can conflict question. on this name. Here's a question. Uh, how are you going to identify that jail using its ID only? I could think that it makes sense to, be, to keep okay, this smaller, it, to, uh, to have the kernel assign a jail ID to it which you don't get to choose, or let's say you, you found, maybe you have to seal the configuration at some point. So you will basically just preload a requested configuration using a bunch of IOCTLs, and then you would say finish configuration or something, yeah. which would keep it simpler to implement, I assume. Okay. The, the kernel would just allow you to <clears throat> add to your parameter list and then try to apply it. And if it applies, you get it, a valid jail we addressed over the files. And, but the idea is that similar to, uh, have you ever looked at how in uh, the inside the kernel, the indirections work for a file descriptor? So in user space, you only use a file descriptor number. And that's an important difference mm -hmm. here because that's the first indirection. At the system call interface from user space, you have an index into logically an array of file handles, which then point to the global file table where you get from file handles to files. And then you have the virtual file system layer mm -hmm. where you get the V from the from a V node to an I node. And then you get to the implementation of an I node for a specific file system. And what would inside the kernel there would be a file um, representing this jail and it would be reachable through a file descriptor mm -hmm. referenced by a file descriptor number in user space, just like any other file. Okay. Uh, like a socket or something. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I, I am trying to think from, again, I'm thinking from an ecosystem mm -hmm. point of view. So, and if so the in, in, in a regular of this file. Yeah. If I reach a zero, the jail is uh, automatically destroyed. So, okay, here's the thing. A regular jail, I can yeah. exec into it using its JID or its name. In the mm -hmm. case of an anonymous jail, I would be able to exec into it using only its ID because now the name doesn't matter. The name, the name is empty. It's null, right? Basically. Yeah, that's what 
That's okay. how I would represent it, just okay. to keep the changes as small as possible. Yes. Uh, that basically it has an empty host name. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, an empty name. An exactly. empty name. Yes. 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 If you I'm create sure. a jail without a name right now, I mean, you can create the jail because I was thinking of that of its uh, JAID. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And this kind of jail I foresee as having no the, truly an empty string. It may, but it may still have a. a Jail ID, if, the, if it's easier for the kernel to implement this, to have the jail ID assigned by the kernel and maybe allow, make it a parameter like any other that you can configure. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, at the moment it gets started, the kernel auto assigns it to you. I, 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 I can tell you the easiest way to implement this reading Jamie's code of the jail thing, you know? uh mm -hmm. it, the, the, you can have name equals underscore that would be literally the easiest implementation it's like four lines of code change you know name not really that. because i'm not saying that the name is going to be underscore i'm saying we can say name equals underscore and in the kernel we will pass you know the name is just a null and if you do jls you will in the name field you will get like nothing <laughs> yeah. We could do what uh, we could do what Linux does for Unix domain sockets and prefix the name with a null bud. Uh, sorry, I'm not uh, aware of that. Uh, prefix the name with a what? Uh, so normally, uh, you if on POSIX, if you have a Unix domain socket, okay. uh, you bind and connect to them by path name, uh -huh. and like any other path name, they yeah. start uh, with anything and end in the null byte. And, but the system calls for handling the um, addresses have a base address of the uh, socket address and the size. So, and the struct itself contains the length and the string. So you can have arbitrary binary data inside the system call interface and Linux came up with this creative abuse of this uh, to have a second namespace, which starts with a null byte, and then is a null terminated string afterward. Uh, yes, abuse is a good word for that. <laughs> abuse is what the, I consider this, because it's, uh, they uh, unintentionally created an, an yet another uh, global namespace. Uh, which has to be uh, virtualized by something like JELS if you ever want to add this. And I would recommend against doing that and just either having a new property void or uh, lots of cleaner solutions um, or extending if there's any restriction on the um, allowed uh, character set within jail names uh, loosen the restriction by one character and allow it as prefix for these jails hmm. so that you get one more Second. possible letter, something like uh, start the name with a dot or something. Okay. Uh, and then name it dot jail ID dot the configured name or something. Wait, I do have a uh, question. Um, Jamie, if, if I have three jails, that have their own ID, obviously, one, two, three, but all of them have empty names, which is going to be null. If, yeah. if I do jail get by name, get jail by name, whatever the, 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 the function name was, and I pass in mm -hmm. the name empty string or null, is it going to identify? The, the name, if you do not pass a name when you create a jail, it creates a name for you, and the name is the, the JID. ASCII JID. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So that is a way that you can create, not anonymous, but certainly guaranteed non-clashing named jails. Yeah. And that's the good only enough. thing is right now, there's nothing in the jail configuration file. There's no way to specify, I, I, I want it like that because the file always is headed by a name. And yeah, I think, yeah, having a reserved name, I don't know about underscore, but dot, which is already not a legal jail mm -hmm. name. If you, you know, yeah. It would make sense to have that as a jail name saying, do not name this jail. And if, yeah, if, well, if, if, and if it's a CI CD pipeline, you, because you're you not using configuration files, you do, you know, jail, uh, 
name. You just don't say a name. Don't. You just say jail, say you know, okay. and you give parameters that aren't the name or the JID. It creates it with a default JID of, you know, the next one in line and also uses that for the name. Mm. You also want, even in a CI/CD pipeline, as an operator, you want to be able to make sense of the inspectable, and it should be inspectable system state. So you kind of want to be able to have these kinds of jails still with a kind of comment-only name attached, so that you know uh, which state of their pipeline they this very busy jail, which is living for days on end, uh, belongs to. Oh, that's a good question. So, you know, as a jail vendor in, in jailer, if someone says jailer create, but doesn't specify name, what I'm doing is the ugliest thing possible, which is I'm running UUID gen on FreeBSD, mm -hmm. which just we got UUID gen dash R, which allows you to get a real random, random. UUID, not based on time. Yay. Thank you. And so the, here's, here's an interesting uh, one. Um, why? It was the, what because, year? um, the randomized ones are strictly inferior if they're implemented in the kernel, like mm. because FreeBSD had a has a get UUID system call. Oh, uh, and I think the base system UUID gen, not the one commonly pulled in from the X2 tools, makes use of the system call and it and, and it reads the configured by the kernel and third, I think, lowest MAC address and timestamp, and it's strictly monotonic so because of because it uses yet time clock and so unless you really have your some kind of you really force the system to be stupid uh, you still get the advantage that you can sort them in a reasonable way and that they don't clutter your index data structures that much because they are not truly randomized but they're still long and globally unique because if your jail hosts have physical NICs with the same MAC address, you already have operational problems. No, no, that's not the point. Wait, from a jail vendor point what of view, what I do is if, if I do jail create, if, if my users mm -hmm. do jail create and they don't specify a name, mm -hmm. I'm using the UUID command. You know, I'm just checking if, if it has the dash R, I use the dash R. Yeah. If it doesn't, I don't, but I'm specifying a dash ID, uh, a, a UUID. Ideally, I wouldn't want to do this, but here's my problem is that I'm also generating a configuration file for them. Yep. So based on the example that uh, Dave just sent is that the right. jail command allows to create a nameless jail, but the jail configuration doesn't allow to create a nameless jail. It has now, always supported this. Okay. Because it didn't, it started out without a configuration file. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the config was added later. Yeah. Oh, the config right. was only nine. added in FreeBSD uh, eight or eight nine. point something or nine, and jail st started in FreeBSD four. So <laughs> I'm so happy that I came to FreeBSD at the nine release, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. We came with all the nice stuff. 9.3, and then I immediately needed... Yeah, ZFS because... was there, oh, no. Dtrace was there, Vnet got it yeah. on the next release, you know? Okay. Yeah, I think I started with 6.2 uh, and was uh, told, no, even if you have problems on your hardware, don't start uh, try 5, because okay. it was still not end of life. So, so okay, so this is very interesting. So in the only in the config file, we don't have this feature, the nameless gel. And... Uh, and Jamie, if I just don't put a name, what would um, happen right now? Like, you know, just- I think don't what you can- You, you can't, do. It, it would not parse. I mean- It would not parse. The, okay. uh, a, a jail mm -hmm. definition is a name followed by the curly bracket and the stuff in it. But okay. You can already set all of the keys you want to set outside of a jail block, right? You, okay. that, yeah, those are defaults. Those, exactly. those are never used to define a single jail. Exactly, only configure defaults and then instruct it to take the defaults from this file and Pass the rest on the command line, and I think uh, uh, I have never tried if you can set the uh, exec dot start and so on default values and just not configure any jail and then instruct it to create a specific jail. Basically, have no jail blocks in your jail. Yeah, if you instruct it to create a specific jail that's not defined, it will say that jail is not defined. What? I mean, if you have a if you have a configuration file, 
that does not have any jails defined and you try to tell it to run a specific jail, it'll give an error. That jail is not oh. in the file. So only if you don't pass it in in the file, uh, the old feature is still available? I mean, you know, I haven't ever tried actually making a file that defines no jails and running it, but I suspect it would not create any jails. Yeah, maybe we should check this rather than uh, proclaim that it has to be this way. <laughs> Um, but um, so coming back to what I want, so we got way deeper into this speak than I assumed. The other thing is, uh, which I really want to see is basically the events available via the uh, DevCTL device, if you have the kernel module loaded, things like, and uh, so this module already hooks these events and makes them available. So well, things like someone has attached to this jail, this, the jail parameters have been updated by someone else and um, the jail has been destroyed. These are the events are having the ability to, uh, so it would be enough, but not elegant to have the kernel auto assign the jail ID and just have a ioctl to read the equivalent uh, jail ID and then do everything with the existing uh, jail attach, remove, get and set system calls. But what I really would like to see is, uh, have the last close be an implicit jail remove. Uh, so then the, um, then the reference count from the jail file, and we can't not the file descriptor, but basically then the okay, last yeah, file descriptor gets closed. That's so something in, in common with connected. process descriptors, but I'm not sure I like that idea of actually, uh, I, I like them being something that merely tracks a jail that does not act upon a jail. Um, that, Yes, that I mean, I, you, you yeah, have the option for user option space programmers killing a jail already. Uh, so but I don't like the space, idea of implicitly. The thing is that implicitly every file like thing on Unix is destroyed, is either is closed with the files. And for, in my mental model, it makes sense to have the jail, unless it maybe unless it's configured persistent, but a non-persistent jail shouldn't outlive the last reference to it. That's, well, yeah, it should not, but- I know. don't want to leak them. If, if I have a jail process and someone sends it a sick kill, I don't want it to leak a jail in the kernel. Okay. I want the kernel to clean up by default. Well, okay, there's two different ways then one could get a descriptor perhaps. Uh, one is you look at a jail and you say, I want a descriptor for this jail. That would uh, the be other very one could nice be, because- You create uh, a jail along with a descriptor. And yeah, in that second case, maybe closing the, the last descriptor in a non-persistent version of the jail mm -hmm. could kill the jail. But you know, if it's a non-persistent non jail, it will die with its last process anyway. So what you're saying is, forcibly kill those processes and things like that. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Uh, do what jail remove would do. Um, if the last, but you're right. Uh, if one way to implement this would be to have the, uh, for jails not created through a file descriptor, have the kernel hold the last reference so that the reference count never can drop to zero. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Oh, by the way, skipping back into the past a little. Yes, you you uh, created try to create a jail from a, a file that does not have any jails defined, and yes, it will say that jail is not found, as expected. Okay. Good to know. Um, but uh, by by the way, Jamie, we were talking about talking about this last week, but I don't know if you did follow up with these type of things over the years. I asked if there was ever a jail implementation, sorry, uh, a jail orchestration, what, whatever that we're calling it these days, a tool, because all of the tools that we have right now, you know, IO cage, Bastille, Jailer, Pot, everyone is using the jail command itself, you know? So my question was, mm. hey, is there any, has there ever been a tool that r just uses the kernel facilities, the system calls itself? Um the kernel facilities or at least libjail. Um, I'm lib not aware jail. of any, but I certainly made libjail so one could uh, do that if they wanted to. 
And so uh, there is a go uh, directed to DC. Um, there is a Go library for managing jails from Go. And because it includes the syscall.go, I would assume that it does all of the system uh, it calls does. itself. Oh, there and you go. It does not uh, call out to the jail uh, command. And I just used uh, a search term FreeBSD jail Golang because I know that Golang does uh, have limitations if you use C libraries. So Go uh, developers tend to uh, reinvent and avoid this and program directly against the system calls so that they don't have the limitations of using C Go. So this one- On a completely different subject, it's uh, getting to be lunchtime around here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Michael, how was so, the dentist? Probably about time for me to bow out. Oh, good, okay. Oh. Uh, this was very informative call at this point. Um, Take care, Jamie. Uh, this, right. uh, thank you, Jamie, and uh, hopefully see you next week. Yes, probably so. I, I just, I phased it last week was the only reason I wasn't there. No excuses. Just <laughs> no worries. Such it still happens. Anyway, see you next week. Cheers. Thanks. Yep. Bye. Uh, yeah, Michael, we talked about a lot of things today. You know, from example configurations to common issues to. GLD process model and Jan came with the good one, which is you know the postfix model. And now we have like a very weird process tree. By the way, I just realized why this what's model... weird about this process tree. Uh, so it's it's it, it's weird to for because I typed it all. It, I had to do like pipe and underscore all the time. Oh uh, because... so the, the very interesting one about this, I just noticed because in my home server I have like 30 GLs at this point, you know. And uh, and the the nice one about this when you have like a parent and then the rest and then it's child. If I do like ps auxd and it prints everything with the you know the trees, all of the jails are going to be right next to each other. You know, right right, right on top of each other, and that's going to be so nice to see like all the jail processes in a single place. Because if I do it now, mm -hmm. it's like in it in here and his child, and somewhere else is like in it and their child. You know, so this is a lot cleaner from a process. <laughs> UX UI point of view as well. If you use DTPS tree, DTPS tree, no, I don't even know what that is. It's a alternative to PS tree, so it prints the process tree. Um, oh no, nope, nope, not at all. I I think I'm 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 very um, uh, what do you call that? I'm very. Oh, wait a second, is this? Oh yeah. I'm very, um, how do you call that? I'm very concerned that a lot of people are reinventing already established Unix tools. Like apparently there's now a cat that is just written in Rust for some reason. Uh, anyway, there's a reason for that. I'm sure there always is. By the way, I do have a well, question. In this case, the Rust people, some of the existing base tools basically are uh, dangerous things like rewriting sudo or su in Rust so that you don't have the pseudo mm -hmm. bug of, of the month or quarter uh, and have to synchronize the release day and everyone has to go scramble to patch it before their students uh, learn about it. Yeah. Also, the, the other thing with, with rewriting Rust is Rust runs on Windows and mm -hmm. a lot of the Unix things we love are not always available. Yeah. Anyway, um, I have uh, a quick question for today, if we, if we got time. Yes, um, I, I, I do have a just, single question. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, it's like a simple yes or no question. That's why. So this is my FreeBSD server. As you can see, who am I? I'm Antronic V. This is my ID, 1001. So here's here's my question, and it's a very weird question. If I, de if I do PSAUXD, right, just PSAUX, mm -hmm. my processes, I'm seeing these processes, which is Ruby, yep. right? But it's in a jail because yep. there is a jail that yep. has a mm -hmm. user with the ID 1001 that is running this Ruby process. And I'm seeing it yes. here. Uh, do we consider this normal or not? Because from my own point of view, I would say no. Um, the thing is that, and I get what you want. You want to treat the 
jail as its lightweight virtual machine with its own, own users and its exactly. own etc path cd and so on which it can mention its own and so because of that uh, you want uh, to um, you want to have this be kind of the user identity to be jail id concurrent uh, the tuple of jail id and user id in a, in a way, very, very, like this, this the, 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 most people had it very nice. It is so. what you're asking for. Yeah. Um, because at the kernel level, the, but the thing, problem is that at the kernel level, the kernel knows about the process is in a jail and it has these, this effective user and these effective groups. Yeah. And, uh, and this primary group and so on. But all of this is flat and you don't have this two level naming. Yeah, not. I, um, I, think, I think it would be a single user space, space line, could right? show it this way. If you're prepared to commit to the fact that every jail is um, every jail um, has to contain a valid uh, user and group and group database file, so the etc uh, cat etc. Uh, What's its name? Uh, PVD, PVDDB. Yes. So, and the same for groups. And so, if you commit to this, um, you can do it. And the way to do it would be to uh, on demand uh, fork a process for the jail ID uh, into the jail and cut this file to standard out and Pause it. Hmm. So lazily, okay. the first time you encounter a jail ID, you uh, J attach to it, l l cut the file, pipe it out to the parent process, uh, and have a parent process added. And then let me say my question again. I'm not rephrasing it, I'm actually message. saying it which is, is this normal? Like, should we consider yes. this a normal behavior? Because from a security point of view, I don't know if it's because, you know, the owner of the jail is the root, you know? The owner mm. of the jail is the root, just because the- does Jail doesn't sense? really have a no, no. It has a parent jail, which would be what the I host. would consider it. If a jail has, every jail except the root jail has a parent jail. Even the, the root jail has a parent, and it's just zero. It's the parent system. Exactly. So uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I meant with the root jail. So the the unjailed parent is the root. Yeah. It every jail the, has a parent. J D zero doesn't have a parent jail, but every other jail has. Okay, but, but like, do we like should be this considered a security issue? Because I mean, from a security point of view, this is you know you, this could only if you get confused by it. <laughs> We should do that. So, I, so I, I think that the, the, the thing here is if I was using it for this for something important, I would use numeric outputs or I would only do it inside from inside the jail so you get the, 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 the information correct. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that's what it boils down to. And you I give too many to make sure they're unique. Yeah. This right. is why I argued for instead of uh, translating the namespaces, having a way to uh, partition the UID and GID namespaces, it doesn't exist as a feature in the kernel. Yeah, uh, and, okay, and so do, do this. So, uh, the idea there would be that uh, you partition the namespaces per uh, in your, and have, let's say, only, uh, UIDs and group IDs under 100,000 are config by configuration are allowed in the root so that yes, even the root is restricted. Kind of strange, but and then each jail gets a range assigned to it. It could be a simple upper and lower bound. Yeah. This is your minimum user ID, this is your maximum user ID. And you and unless uh, and you would have a the cleanest way to do it would be to have a 
j attach where you have to specify the user uh, ID you are afterwards or the whole permissions that basically user ID, group ID, and group list afterward. So what you have mm. to specify at with which uh, credentials do you attach to the jail? So that because to keep it clean, the parent is prohibited from using this. And if you um, you could have basically a, a reservation so that you can have a range, a large range you give to a jail, which it can then restrict itself. So from, oh, um, no, it would be pre-configured that you would say, okay, your, for example, your CI jail is configured to have jail IDs, uh, 100,000 to 200,000, but only the lower 10,000 of that are ever are usable inside it. The rest is only a reservation, which it can then use for the CI runners. Mm. But to make this usable, you need um, like UnionFS does or UmapFS used to do uh, the ability to masquerade the through uh, virtual file system overlays, the view to a read-only file system so that you don't have to rena renumber each a user ID by renaming all files in the jail root directory. Every time the jail gets assigned a new interval. Uh, instead, you would only set this on setting up the jail, you would configure a file system overlay, which basically does this subtract the difference and do a bounce check. Well, again, let me bring it this let me bring it back all this way. Okay. So uh this is all in FreeBSD. Not a lot of people use FreeBSD. Hopefully one day, a lot of people will use FreeBSD. And <laughs> when the time comes that a lot of people use FreeBSD, a lot of people don't know about this, that the, 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 if the UID is the same, you can see from the up to the down. And Yes, the, from the up to the down, but not the other way around. Yes. And so you can only see your children. You can't see your siblings or your parent. Here's a question. Do you think that I can right now send a signal to this process? Of course you can. Okay, but should I? Because I'm, I'm. Of course I'm... you can. Of course you should. Because the jail user uh, process namespace is a subset, a partition of the parent uh, process namespace. Mm. This, this is actually really worrying. Like, I understand what you mean. Yeah. No, it's not yeah. worrying. It's by design. It's supposed to be that way. That's how it works. It's not an attack vector. It's an intended feature. I'm supposed to be able to send a signal from the from a parent of a jail into the jail. But but I am not root. You see what I mean? You're well. It's a misconfiguration to have the same user ID as a collide. Well, I don't, oh. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it, this. it's one of these your job as an unexpected, unexpected consequences of, of um, things not being fully separated, isn't it, effectively? Because like in Illumos, they didn't have this problem, apparently. Um, I think that... I've read comments suggesting if you support it, but it's, yes, by default they isolate it. But it would be you would lose things. Maybe I want to uh, send a signal to instruct a service running inside a jail to reload itself. <coughs> Bless you. So I'm um, I'm I'm thinking like from right. this point of view, like you know, you're a, you're a company. You're like, oh, okay, jails are awesome. You have a host machine. And your host machine has users on it, but you know your mm -hmm. users don't have root. Great. And now you created. A, you say, oh, okay. Um, I need to run. I don't know a PHP application. Sure. So you're like, okay. I don't want to go into dependency hell. So I create a jail. Great. I just did that. Now I go into there and I want to create a single user in there for my developer to SSH to my jail. Great. I just create. Fine. That. And now, like this is like like there's no way for you to know this by reading even all the documentation and all the man pages, that hey, 
uh, user ID 1000 on the host and user ID 1000 in the jail while they are totally separate people. One of them is Michael and the other one no, is No, they're not. But that's the thing, like from 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 an invalid from, assumption to consider them different. There's your mistake. They are not different. One is a subset of the other. Here's here's a fun one. Let me show you this. So let me do this. So how, how I think as a system administrator, if they are the same or not, right? So if I go to this um, jail that's running that Ruby mm -hmm. process, I think it's called like this. And great, and that user is with the ID 1001, even has, oops, sorry, 1000, was it? Wow. No, am, am, I, am I in the Get wrong? Get PV and user. Let's see if I'm looking in the right place though. Oh, I, th I think that was in a different jail. Oh, great, so how would I do know even which jail that is? How would I know in which jail a process is? Anyone have any idea? Uh, you can, of course, uh, Pro all of the common tools allow you uh, to look it up. Uh, well, you can you can get PS to print out the jail ID. Like you yeah, just yeah. enable the column. Then oh, PS, uh, well, well, PS AUXD and dash J? J? Or no, uppercase J? Or uppercase. One of the two is it? Let's see. Uppercase J. Or jazz I think. Job. No, uppercase is for. Uppercase is for. You've got to uh, provide it as a. Um, as, a, as, an, as an O from memory, an option. Uh, yeah. How do you do that? Uppercase J. Uh... Just, I use HTOP for this, by the way, because you can configure it once in the config bar and forget about it. And then the J, the, um, but it's imports non base. And you have to specify, for the uppercase J, you have to specify this, which J you want to filter on. Okay. Uh, it's a list, there it's is, a comma separated you list. Read the man page, it'll tell you how to show other options. And you just add an option for JIT and it appears there. I can't remember what is up top of my head. But uh, Procstat can definitely display the uh, jail ID. I, yeah, I know, right? I, I, for the love of God, I can't find it. I'm, I'm pretty sure it can. But for the love of God, I can't. Where part is of it? It's, uh, um, and it's part of its credentials. So uh, where you it, can list the user ID and so on. I hate this word. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, 1001. And there should be. Uh, there is no jail ID. Oh, well, you're inside the jail. You know what? There is no jail ID. Strange, right? There is no jail ID. Isn't this interesting? That's a good feature to add, by the way, inside uh, Protstat to show the jail ID. Uh, um, AUXV, AUXV. Nope, not, no. Argument, no. Arguments. Arguments. You can definitely not. My last option. I, I think you should be a P PS web, uh, format. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do that. Man, PS. Uh, jail. Great. This yeah, no, nope, but that one. It's and... a filter. Not no, a... no. There's you can uh, there's a you can a add columns to to display. Right. There's like a dash o flag or something, and you can. Oh, put there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, PS, AUX, D, let's say, dash, how do we do that? O, dash, O equals uh, J, A, L. There we go. And here there's, no, I think I added way too much. Let's put it this way. I, I, I can't remember if it, if it is dash O. Maybe it's dash O space. Okay. I, I'm not really good in PS, apparently. I'll just do it this just, way. Just, it's at the top of the main page. We just skipped past it. Oh. So it's it's like dash, o. dash is it dash o format or is it um it's dash o format? I'm trying yes. to read this on a phone. So um, the font is it's uh, just uh, o sp sp and then the argument without the equal. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. upper uh, case. Hogan. Okay, I'm running Hogan. I'm sorry, I totally forgot. Okay, great. So let's go there. So okay, here's my system administrator point of view, right? On the host, this the user one thousand and one is Antronic V. That's me. Great. Yeah. Okay. But then if I go into the jail, again zero. Why do I think as a system administrator that this is totally a different user? Because well, from my point of view, it's a different user. It has a different name, right? So when I'm creating a user, that's what I'm thinking about. 
Do, do you the see? Google Apple? doesn't know about usernames. It knows about user IDs and group IDs. Uh, look, look, it you're works in a numeric yeah, namespace. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. wait. Explaining to me the situation, right? I know the situation. I'm saying the situation is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that can be argued, but I guess um, the original question was: Is it normal? And to me, this totally makes sense because I think of the like when I create a process, I don't create a process that has a name. It has um, a UUID and a group ID exactly. associated with it. So that's what I think. List. Um, how do I deal with this in practice? Um, if I have users, they don't get accounts on systems, they get accounts inside jails. Um, but uh, And obviously, yeah. Hogan doesn't see Antronix processes, obviously. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But so to, me, to, to example, me, it seems normal. I, I think it's annoying. I think it's annoying. By, uh, it's user ID. On the host with RCTL, they would apply to both. So if you had a yeah. memory limit for the user ID of Hugen configured in your jail configuration, it would also limit the same user ID everywhere if you scope by user ID only. Right. So, oh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and that's... the uh, mistake there is to uh, treat this as a hierarchical namespace when it is a flat namespace. Uh, and what you have to do, it's annoying, I know, uh, is, but you what have like, to should, have should the centralized management of this namespace. Should, should I tonight? Can be. Should I tonight, after our call, go to FreeBSD and send a patch about this? That's my end question. Like, no yeah. normal system administrator, after reading all the man pages, blog posts, and handbooks about jails, are ever going to think that, yeah, it's the same user. You know, because they're, they're thinking it's a different slice of my system. This should have not had happened. You, you see what I mean? Like the, the defaults matter. That's why, you know, OpenBSD people are the best because de the defaults matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> to me, well, to me like just it's totally normal because jails are just a hierarchical arrangement of processes. Yeah. Um, and But not users. When the output of PS is not really a process with the name of a user, it's just... Uh, I mean, I agree it's a wart. I would call it a wart. And if you're going to get rid of it, I think you would have to eradicate a lot of things. Like, I think for me, when, when you first put the, the thing was, ah, what you really want to do is show it with, without the, the translation from name to you. You want you don't want the translation from um, UID to name. That's then I would expect that to apply. But there's lots of things. As Jan said, um, file system quotas will apply um, to the user of the same ID, uh, mm -hmm. process limits, lots and lots of things. So um, to me, that seems quite normal on FreeBSD. Yes. What you can do uh, with mm, limited changes just to the tooling would be to have something like PW uh, support basically allocating uh, mm -hmm. the user ID on the host. And then you would, it's so that if you want to have this dynamically and you want to have an independent jail host and not have to deal with a global user and group database like mm -hmm. LDAP or something, or whatever else you use as your source of truth. Um, that case, you could have just treat the um, configuration files of the host as source of truth, and then have a way to easily Register a name prefix with a jail name or something. Of course, this assumes a fairly static setup because these files aren't really that dynamic. You have to recompile the read only uh, Berkeley DB database files for the fast lookups and so on. But that you could do. Yeah. Um, okay. This again. This is a very weird problem to have. Like again, I'm I'm very I'm thinking from a very basic system administration point of view. It, it's it's hard to convey that message. And I did we did try this at our company. You know, we did mm -hmm. the reason why I know this is, is because we did enc encounter this problem, and we ended up mm -hmm. actually using NIS because you know now we have oh. a centralized UID management, and you know we do know who everyone is. You know, uh, the other thing everyone. is that. It only becomes a problem when the jail parent, so the host, mm -hmm. uh, is also used for service. If your two uh, hypothetical developers each get the same user ID, 
but in on a different jail. Different jail only. That's fine. Just slightly uh, confusing uh, to the administrator of the host because those user IDs, are, unless you also start from thousand like uh, FreeBSD does by default, would be uh, unnamed ones, and then you would just default to printing the name because there is no uh, uh, the number instead of the name because there is no uh, reverse lookup. Mm. In that case, mm. if you just configure your jails to start the allocation outside of the automatic allocation range of the host, uh, it won't collide with anything created on either side later, but it, of course it would still collide inside the um, inside the jails. So, which is only a problem if you, um, for example, use RCTL or resource limits per user ID on shared resources. So if you have two ZFS data sets, each one a route to the diff a different jail with a quota and a reservation uh, for a specific user ID, and you have two jails which each have their own data set, while they collide, they are namespaced into the data set and which then deconflicts this. Uh, what I find interesting is that for some reason I never was surprised because it just kind of made sense as to how I understood a Unix to work. Uh, oh. but, and I didn't assume, but I totally see your argument that if you think on the layer of pure mental model of it isn't humanomics for user IDs, but this is a user, it has a name. <laughs> It has a name, it's, and the user ID is an attribute of the user and not the user ID is a real thing and the have is only an alias name for it, mm -hmm. for human consumption, then yes, it totally makes sense that this blows up in your face. Dan, you have a lot of jails, I think. <laughs> How, uh, have you ever encountered this problem? I can't answer that because I haven't been listening because I've been trying to answer email. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> if you ask me, if you ask me a short question, maybe I can answer it. How are you? I'm not bad. Okay, so that's that passes <laughs> as an answer. <laughs> I, I've definitely encountered this because I run all my um, almost all of my apps run as the WW user or as bind um, mm -hmm. in jails because that saved me creating accounts because I'm. I'm very lazy as a, as a sysadmin. And so to me, that's quite normal. When I think back to it, um, all the systems I'd used from the very early days with um, OpenVMS was the first multi-user system I used um, through um, NetWare and Windows. All of those had internal mappings of IDs to names and the very early ones only let you manipulate the IDs initially. Oh. So, uh, so all the commands uh, that IDs and the name was a property that you could set and it was the thing that a user logged in with but other than that um it was it was invisible so it's, to me it's quite normal yeah so uh, I, I, uh when i encountered this like around a year and a half two years ago i sent it to the mailing list that is this and my, my, my but the beginning of my problem wasn't even the idea of the you know seeing it my first problem was yeah. that the name of the user inside the jail is different than the name of the user outside the jail while they do match the same ID. And I actually ended up having a tiny fork of PS, which I think I still do somewhere in our company Git. And I built a PS that if the process is in a jail and you have to run this as root always, there's no other way to do this because yeah. you know you can't do JExec, you know, jail attach as non-root. And I, I tried to do this. So we created like, I want to say not maybe like 10,000 on the magnitude of order, or maybe 50, sure, whatever, jails with, uh, with generated usernames inside of them. And each of the jail, you know, the, 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 each of them had a single process, which was, I guess it was like Tmux or Shell or whatever it was that was running. And then I do PSAUXD and I wait for the output. And it took a very long time. I'm talking minutes just to print We were out. talking pathological cases are pathological. Because like it has to jail attach, get the name, pass it to the parent, die, and every time for every process that was jailed. 
And uh, I don't know how Illumos has this. Maybe like by design, they thought of the mapping as part of all of that, you know? And I'm not even sure that FreeBSD is flexible enough right now to do that modification, to have the jail name and jail user mapping appropriately shown to the parent. Because you, you saw it the other day, it was very nice. Like it would... If the name matches, it prints the name. If name doesn't match, it prints only the ID, you know? So, like, it was a very nice mechanism of, of doing that on Illumos. Mm. Um, I think what they're doing different, the long identifier he saw in the parent zone or in the global zone, as they call it, is that uh, he saw a long number and claimed that it was effectively the concatenation of the zone identity fire so the their jail id equivalent and the user id which is why it was a very large number yes um, you can do the same on you could do the same if the data integer or data type you use to identify it is long enough to contain the concatenation of two smaller integers you can do that mm -hmm. to basically allocate the upper bits to this logical value and the lower bits to this so, so, so uh, from inside the jail, you would see everything as is. From outside the jail or the parent jail or the parent friend or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you, uh, the, the system call, or in this case, a library call, it would be, that's getting the information of the process. It would return the ID concatenated with the other ID, the jail ID concatenated with the process ID. And yes. at that point, um, you're like 99, not, okay, well, there's a specific number. It's one. Well, in that case, you're absolutely sure as long as they, there are enough bits so that the fields can't overlap. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, I, I, the, or something. the chance of that, according to Unix, is one in 65,500. No, the chance is either there or not. Okay. Don't, you can't just ignore it and hope for the best. <laughs> you have to specify your system effect correctly. So, so uh, yeah. In, so you, if you have, let's say you let your set EUID system call and so on, and EGID and the others to uh, only accept uh, values with the um, um, so in a at least in a zone, you limit them to the, uh, the lower half of the available bits. Uh, and then the parent, if you're saying two, so uh, you uh, then have the namespace split. And you, in reporting them, you uh, write out the um, JID in the upper half of the bits. So if you have, in, if your UID uh, mm -hmm. type is a 64 bit integer and both your now, subset of the bits used is 32 bits, and for the JLID namespace is uh, the right number of bits. You can just combine them and always report them as that. Or you can uh, add a new set of system calls to um, read a tuple of numbers. So the JLID and the um, the should JLID I and the. Uh, should I modify that ID. in PS? Should, should I modify that in PS where it returns? For the jail processes, it returns the process ID, at least just the process ID, for now, or something. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what I want. No, no, no. the process ID is always a process ID that okay. doesn't collide. Uh, but the user and group IDs are what's clashing. Oh yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the, the the user ID, sorry, user ID instead of the user name, or it would, yeah, I mean, but it would the kernel would return the process ID. If it's in a jail, the actual ID. If it's outside the jail, the you know the jail ID plus that so ID. You could even do the following. You could attempt to uh, read the jail uh, root directory path and try to read the uh, jail user database without ever attaching to the jail. If, which of course uh, exposes you to parsing an evil database. Yeah. Uh, hey, I mean, correct PS does that anyway. Um, PS does that anyway. No, it but... doesn't. No, no, I mean, it, it doesn't, doesn't get It doesn't go into the jail. But the Biden. untrusted jail exactly. is, is the thing you want to watch out for. So, so I think, bring this back full circle, a patch to PS that 
only displays um, UIDs rather than names and allows you to prefix that with a jail ID might be might be useful. Um, but can't you already do that with dash O by printing the... Uh, totally can. I think you, you can, totally can. So press yep. the printing of the named user, print Jan. the jail and the user ID. Jan, Jan, two things. First, let the man talk. And second of all, Sorry. defaults matter. Defaults yes, matter. They do. I know yeah, I, I, I can right now, but I won't when my, you know. Okay, let, let me bring you the whole background of the story. I teach a group of teach people who are like 20 year olds and I, I call them, you know, cybersecurity class. But in reality, I'm teaching them Unix because, you know, these <laughs> kids, they graduate university and they don't know the command line. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Of course you're learning cybersecurity. But in reality, they're installing a snort on FreeBSD, you know, but at the end of the day, if the if the defaults are not good, the class and the learning curve is going to be always longer and higher. But the defaults are good. It's mm -hmm. like you're focusing on your problem instead of teaching them. Oh, you know what? PS has this thing where you can do dash O and get your own output. You know, it's it's a whole big mess. The defaults matter. Yes, there are a lot of things that we can do, but the the, the, the it's like like we shouldn't. <laughs> it just should be. The problem is that you can't do what you consider the same default by default because it would break existing uh, some uh, usage. It would break existing usage. Yeah, yeah, that that is. So correct. there may be tons of scripts out there which is depend on the current default behavior. If yeah. you and because of that, you're never going to twenty years after the fact or twenty three or twenty four years after the fact get to change the defaults retroactively in such an incompatible way. You can add an easy to use uh, flag for a nice output format, mm. uh, which is the next best thing you're going to get after the fact. By the way, has anyone noticed that man LS uses all of the alphabet letters? Just FYI. <laughs> yeah, it probably does now. Yeah. Yeah, and and on and on that's Mac why OS, we, that's why we have to get off. And on <laughs> Mac OS, it uses the at sign. You use at and uses the comma <laughs> sign. The comma. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's for um special file attributes, isn't it? Yeah. It's just. Uh, I never realized it was why. So now I know why they use an at sign. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they're like just. I'm not sure that's something we should be proud of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, at least in Armenian, we have like 30 something, 38 letters. So. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should do that. You should sub submit a patch for PS. You can keep it for April 1st next year. Um, <laughs> that adds this functionality, but with an Armenian letter, like with a Cyrillic <laughs> letter, I think that'd be great. <laughs> if you pick the right letter, it will look like one that's already there on people who only have US Latin configured and then they will reply and tell you you've already you've picked an existing option yeah you know. that, that would be nice yes okay on a, a homonym attack at the command no 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 don't don't okay um hmm. i think we're go coming close to three hours right no, yeah three hours yeah uh, uh um <sighs> if, yeah go on Jan. um if we're done with it, because I think we are walking and circles for the last 15 minutes or so, where I'm defending the existing state or explaining how we are locked in and you just want it to work. And uh, yeah. Dave, you had some something that, and I interrupted you. So. Yeah, one, one little question. So I was looking at some stuff I'd done um, a while ago and noticed that the jail actually doesn't terminate correctly, but when I spin up the next iteration of the jail, it just seems to sort of work. And what I can't see as a user is what is the thing that is stopping this jail from dying? And I know that I've unmounted all the file systems in it. Um, I know that there are no processes left, mm -hmm. but on this particular system, the jail does not die. And I think this is the, the number one frustrating thing as a user going, what is holding this thing back? And I I would love something. I don't know where it needs to sit, whether it's actually a jail specific thing or it's actually something else that says, 
what is holding this damn thing open? Tell me what right. it is. Right. Um, if I'm writing a script to deal with this problem, the same thing applies. Yeah. So when I'm when I had when I encountered the the on free BSD fourteen the problem of the jail staying dying and never dies, and that turned out mm. to be a ZFS problem. The way that I figured out it was a ZFS problem is I ended up uh, doing a kernel panic as soon as the jail died, and I did the kernel panic using DTrace. Uh -huh. Because in DTrace, you can have destructive commands. And I said, when you execute jail remove, uh, as soon as jail remove uh, exits, ex execute panic. And that's a you know system call. So, sorry, that's oh, a neat, you should, command. You should post that. That'd be a neat trick. Yeah, that's a So this idea. is on the exit of jail execute function, is it? On the jail, jail yeah. attach function. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. So jail yeah. attach, jail remove. Even you can even you know use DTrace to trace the library calls as well, not only the not only the uh, system calls. So uh, I I looked into you know yeah. which step is like the command is done. Great. So as soon as it was done, I was like panic. And now DTrace brought me a kernel a debug shell, you know, with DB the sign. And now I have to start yeah. digging into it. Now I didn't understand much, but I started asking on IRC, and we went with back traces <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. And in the end, I figured out okay, okay, there's a ZFS reference that is still locked that is not being unlocked. And uh, the easiest way for me to do that was actually you go into the jail subsystem. And in the jail subsystem, you get the information of all the jails, the structs of all the jails, and you can start looking into what, in which state the kernel is. Because in the kernel, we have, I, we discussed this before, we have like 160 go-tos where the subsystem just flies back and forth, which basically goes, checks, cleans up, it can't clean up, goes to a queue, waits there, comes back, checks, cleans up, can't clean up, goes back to a queue. And at that point, I figured out at which state it was locked. And it turns out it was on VFS, which was running on ZFS. I the tried jail did it state state, for example. Yeah, so I, I still don't know what the problem was. I only, uh, what the exact, what the root cause was. I just knew it had something to do with ZFS. I tried the exact same jail on the exact same configuration on UFS, and it just worked fine. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is an FS problem. Mm. So it was reproducible. I don't know how to fix it or what the root cause was. But that's the only way that I would do it is, or, and it, of course, this is if it is not a production system because you're doing system panic, you know? Uh, you with I know, I know how to reproduce it now. So I, can, I, can, I can do it offline. Yeah, okay, that's, um, that's so very valuable. There are not enough of these little videos that show people how to do that, that sort of stuff. Kill it, kill, kill. Kill, panic the system when this function exits and then walk through looking for stuff in the kernel. I think yes. that, that would, it would be great to see more of that sort of thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very this, is such an, this is such awesome marketing. Tool. Like if you show this to developers that you can panic your whole system yeah. with a kernel dump and everything. Uh, and like this is, uh, Linux even today doesn't have this properly. And like this is something that we should market um, to developers. Yes, Jan, sorry, I interrupted you. So the... Uh, why it's so powerful what you just described is because uh, if you do a uh, function boundary uh, detrace <laughs> tracing in yeah. the kernel, you just manage your bug to become synchronous with uh, your yes. panic. Yes. So normally, yeah. if you do tracing, it's as synchronous as possible, but this way by having the, the um, prologue to the function or wherever you're hooking into, not just record data to be appended to the uh, detrace log, but by synchronously making the system, you get there with the, the very valuable backtrace yes. to mm. show you where you're stuck. But uh, that's the, it's great that you managed to find this out, but most of the time uh, it's not this bad. And it's something less problematic. It's something like a user's unkillable user space process stuck on a hung NFS mount or something. Yeah, yeah. Some uninterruptible process dangling around or some hook which doesn't finish uh, on teardown, something like this. Is it those you would see? For those, those things, it's you. good enough to run it in trust instead of uh, D-trace, uh, which gives you a 
trace of all system calls, uh, which for simple commands like with no background activity, like, like the command line jail to, it's very nice because you have the the crazy garbled startup where it reads the locale and so on, and reads the time zone information. And afterward, you have a point where it only does the system calls related to what you actually want to accomplish. And then oh, you- That's uh, also a really good idea, yeah. So, so I would just run the jail command under trust and you can attach to it, which uh, is sometimes what you want, but sometimes not because then per thread in the process you are attaching at runtime to, uh, get interrupted and you then the system calls potentially seriously return with an e inter yeah yeah so this yeah. can actually uh, have a unlock some problem accidentally and uh, change the state you want to debug but uh, it doesn't even if it does it tells you something namely that there are something no, just blocking on an operation or easy cat oh so all right uh, um uh, we should probably uh, think about wrapping up soon. But, if, yeah, yeah that, that that's would be my go-to tool chain using dtrace and the attaching to the specific. If if you know it, even that's even better. But yeah, it's a jail, so you can do, uh, you know, jail remove the return uh, hook of it, and you know, just see what happens there. And um, it could be the, uh, the easiest way to do that for now. And the synchronicity is very important because when you do a backtrace, you see at that exact point, you know, so that's good. Uh, another one mm. was, um, so um, I don't remember. Uh, so yeah, here's an idea. This is nothing general related. I showed this to my mentor and he's like, hey, what if we were able to use a tool chain like this where let's assume, or let's say that if, if we know all the bad calls that would happen, right? Like this function should never return minus one. If it did, then something really went bad. And usually in FreeBSD, you yeah. have a subsystem that cleans that bad subsystem, right? So his idea was, hey, what if we write dtrace scripts that starts monitoring for all the bad stuff? And as soon as it happens, kernel dump happens, kernel dump. And like, that's a very easy way to find bugs, you know, in a, in a, in a, in an operating kernel system. Kernel dump or backtrace? Like to... Backtrace, you yeah. know? Yeah. Stuff like that. So, oh, by the way, which reminds me, if, if you do need dtrace stuff there. Like, like... a lock or uh, auto reversal detection? Yeah. So, so, so what you could do is, is if you don't want to panic, this is, this was very useful because we, we encountered this on production, right? So what we, we can do yeah. is in Dtrace, you can do um, the stack would print the stack of the application. Uh, use stack would print the user land stack at that point the, with the, with his back traces. And if it's a high level application that Dtrace supports, you could also do J stack. So, you know, if, if it's Java or something like that. By the way, the Erlang runtime system has support for that. So it would print the function names of the does, Erlang yeah. application. Yeah. So that, that I, I should be, check to see if it still works. Uh, it um, does. It does still work. I've, but last time I've I checked it. was in uh, OTP uh, 21. Which version are we on right now? 25? 26 is coming up. I'm already looking at oh 26. Oh, my God. Yeah. 26 is coming real soon. Yeah. yeah. No, we, we're still on 23. I using R12. R12B. That's what I first encountered. So, <laughs> anyway, I did it. So, um, yeah, D D trace, definitely D trace. Cool. Definitely D trace. So, that, that's one. So, what do we got for next week then um, in our jail world? Where, where are we heading? So, I'm just sort of taking a step back here. We've started talking about mm -hmm. supervisors and processes, mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking towards what. What what happens next? What are we what are we trying to do next? Something we can cover in our meeting or um, so so we're going to head towards an objective, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, per it's got to be objective here. We we make code. We personally, my company has interest in replacing the jail command in our usage because for us, our biggest I want to say bottleneck kind of has been the jail command itself, right? So now yeah. we have our Oberon prototype, which is, you know, UCL plus Libexo 
uh, does very basic stupid things. It doesn't assume anything, doesn't return errors when it's parsing the stuff. If it's like, oh, this is a variable, do uh, is it defined in the JL struct? Okay, then I use it. Is it not defined? Okay, then I, I export it as an environment variable for someone else to use. Like it's, it's that stupid. My interest now yeah. that now I have that prototype is adding um, the supervision tree. So now it can become a daemon, but I think I'm going to start with implementing mm -hmm. uh, this part, you know, the, the supervisor first, and then having the actual parent that would act as, um, what do you call it, as, as a main supervisor. But my, uh, my company's interest would be to not only have Unix sockets but in our implementation, but also a TCP IP uh, socket that can be a replace that yeah. can be used similar um, to Docker host that can be used similar to a Docker host. This is already in our roadmap. So like we are going to build this anyway, and hopefully many, many I'm, parts of this code can be reused in FreeBSD's jail. Yeah, cool. Um, the, the, I guess the one thing to bear in mind is if we're putting stuff in the base system, we really only have the choice of C, C++ and Lua. Yes, yes, yes. And we, we, um, yeah. we, we don't... But once it, uh, C C plus plus, so we're I'm doing a it. run. Yes, Jan. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. <laughs> I have a, a. I just came up with an idea how you could expose it in a neat way. You could uh, implement an SSH subsystem for it. Oh yeah, if um, I, yeah, that's a very unknown idea. feature. Yes, um, because that way you all you because the biggest fear I had is that you get to re uh, implement authentication badly and encryption uh, if you. Um, leave the Unix namespace where you can use uh, the UID and GID for access control on sockets mm -hmm. where you can have the kernel uh, authenticate the uh, client. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you could just uh, expose it as an SSH subsystem and then you uh, become the right user uh, and access it. And as long as you don't uh, add anything which depends on file descriptor passing and instead use uh, the path in your protocol, uh, you can just proxy yep. it. Yep. Yeah, that's a good idea as uh, well. Yeah. And yeah. For yes. performance reasons, registering it as a subsystem has the neat uh, result that you don't get an interactive uh, locking session, but you still have an established authenticated connection and then mm -hmm. can send com commands to it to spawn yeah. off jails or get responses back. Yeah, I, I showed that to mm -hmm. a friend and he was like, so this is like CGI, but for SSH. <laughs> yeah, basically it is. It's like yeah. fast CGI, yeah. but yes. Yeah. But All right. comparing it to CGI isn't wrong. Uh, yeah, that, that's on, that's on, 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 on our company's roadmap that we'll be implementing. Hopefully we will be done by all of this by summer. And we're... we're Whatever is polished is going on GitHub anyway. So the Oberon libraries mm -hmm. are already in there. Uh, so um, I don't know how we will continue forward with that. Um, uh, so yes. Oh, I uh, foresee a problem with uh, removing the parent. And that you lose the uh, capability to have jails depend on other jails. Yes, that's correct. We don't use that. that the, uh, that's again, oh, the, yeah, the company thing. We, we don't use that. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you will need that back, right? Otherwise, Dan is going to start yelling on, 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 on Twitter and Mastodon that why is parent jails are not working anymore, you know? <laughs> yep. um, so uh, I still have a little bit of example to share, but I would prefer that not to be recorded because that's uh, production. Okay, yep. sounds mm -hmm. good. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's that. And um, I, I don't think I have any more things in here. Uh, Michael, who has an AMD ACPI problem. Anyone here has expertise? It's it's this golden number bug, which is 27070. Yeah. Uh, that's been haunting us. Somebody should like. give him a, drink, a shot for that number alone. <laughs> So I, I, are there any new comments in here? Yes, yeah, Michael has some updates. Um, they yeah. has been tried with disabling the ACAD and CM bath didn't help. Tried with um, stops at- You here. can't just disable ACPI on 64-bit uh, multi-core systems anyway, because you need VA picks, which are only discoverable exactly. via the ACPI exactly. table. So you can't 
So uh, here we ended up. You with may like, be able to uh, thrust it in the loader to uh, disable SMP support. And oh. Then uh, if you have, then you may be able to get by with only the legacy interrupt, only with a pick without the APIC. Uh, uh, get the system at least to a console. But, that, that's actually a very good idea. I completely ignored that. I completely uh, that. that sounds like good. So disabling multi. I haven't tried this in ages because I haven't had such a broken system in ages. <laughs> that does sound so. Yeah, this is this one. It says set debug ACPI disabled equals all. It ends up with no devices available. It's because on the AMD machines, it uses the ACPI tables to figure out on which bus is which device. If there's no ACPI, you can't figure out where each device is. It ends up with not booting. Uh, I think it doesn't even show, as far as I know, it doesn't even show the mouse and keyboard. I'm not, I might be wrong. But the problem is that without ACPI, you don't know the addresses of the interrupt controllers of the application processors, so you can't even send them an interprocessor interrupt to start them. Yeah. Do anything with them, and so you can't boot them. So yeah, this sense. is, if anyone has any tips, you're welcome. Otherwise, yeah. But the, the tip about the S, disabling SMP—that that's a good idea. I, I didn't think of that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll, we'll ask it's not anything you want to do in production, but uh, yeah, maybe able to. Uh, and the other thing you can, could do is uh, once you get that far, you may be able to get a KGDB uh, service running, and then you can attach to the kernel and find mm -hmm. out what is there. Maybe just either put in a proper breakpoint or just a rate loop polling a variable you clear in the debugger mm -hmm. so that you basically let the system boot up to this point, hit a while uh, x, x equals uh, one while x delay loop, and then you attach with a debugger, clear the x variable, setting it to zero, and then while you're single stepping, you can continue from there. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how I do it on microcontrollers. I don't know if any watchdogs will yell at you. Uh, it did. Stuff like that. It did. The AMD SB watchdog started yelling. It's like, I'm returning six. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> the other thing, oh, there's something else. Uh, if it even gets that far, huh? you want to look at that. That's disabling the uh, automatic kernel module loading via dev uh, match. So that you don't uh, load any kernel modules. Yeah, what else you could do is you, uh, you can mask kernel modules. A lot of kernel modules can be hinted off yeah. uh, from loader conf. Yeah, but so this don't is... attach to this. Don't attach to this. Don't attach to this. The, but this is the installation um, media that's not even booting. Yeah. Um, well, in the can, installation, can we do that there? The bootloader prompt you can access. Oh right. Uh, in there, you you the boot process, set it okay. from hand. Or use these days we mostly install via USB sticks, right? You can mount yeah. them right above. You don't have to burn a new ISO. And the last bit was my question, which is how to check for a jail heartbeat or state internally from a vendor point of view. And while we were having the call, my engineer texted me, hey, apparently, you know, how about I just pipe the checks to JEXEC? And it will just return the actual value that we care about, and that that was a <laughs> very um, easy result. I was looking for something else, but it was you know a, a very simple, stupid solution. Just pass a send a command every couple of seconds or whatever it is that hey, can you check for the state and you get the state back basically. Something uh, you may overlook is that you can uh, the clean solution to this. I think would be to uh, either have something pull the jail from the outside uh, if you have some kind of health endpoint in your API. Mm -hmm. So if let's say it's an HTTP service mm -hmm. and you just have a under dot well known or somewhere or somewhere within your application namespace, you just have a route in your application where if you hit this yeah. endpoint, you get a health report back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the, yeah. the completely external jail unaware way. Yep. If you do a jail aware, um, you could pass in a, a null FS mount directory with a socket in it so, and have that report to the socket. 
in our case, it's a honeypot. So if, if we're running an SSH honeypot, we can just check is, is the SSH accessible from the outside, like from the host itself. Yeah. You know, the bare minimum. Yeah. Just monitor it's a... it like ever, ever, any other network facing service. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Or so... um, if you, the other thing you could do, which would be if you were only worried about the SSH crashing or something, you could run it in the foreground and uh, use some kind of process supervisor like six uh, or run it or daemon tools or part D or whatever you like from parts, uh, run it in the foreground. And if it exits, uh, it just exits uh, mm -hmm. JXX uh, and even jail with the command thing in the foreground work just fine across jail boundaries. So you can, can run a, the jail command in a blocking fashion and not have it run something as demons, but configure everything to run jail. And then you even get the logs written to standard out to be easily consumed on the host. Uh, but that's a totally different, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else anything? Or should we close our session for today? Did you solve all the things? Did we solve all? Yes, sir. We solved world hunger. <laughs> well, Hopefully, one. I got to dump my design ideas on you, on uh, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Jan, if you're if if you're okay with compiling Oberon code, I'll be happy to make you our first beta user. <laughs> <laughs> the problem compiling so, it if, if the compiler is available as port or package. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. I have never written it. I'm not a fan of the verbose Pascal syntax, but that's, it's readable. So it's easier to read than see if you're not already familiar with it, probably. Yes. Cool. Okay, let's catch you next week then. Yep. Sounds good. Well, uh, see you everyone next week okay. and uh, I'll be stopping the recording. Thank you all very much. This was May, okay. this is yeah. Yeah, May the 3rd and uh, meeting adjourned. I'm so sorry, May the, yeah, May the 3rd apparently. Uh, <laughs> okay, see you next week then. Ciao. See you. Bye.